Hey, hello everyone. Today I have a very bizarre case. Um, and it's considered unsolved. Um, the death of Ray Rivera was listed as undetermined and that kind of has fueled many, many, many theories and a couple books and, and a, an unsolved mystery show. Because anytime you say something is undetermined and is still a mystery, you betcha, people are going to jump on that because there's money to be made. <laughs> so anyway, it's going to be really interesting. The question is going to be, do we go with Occam's razor or a rabbit hole or something in the middle? So first, before I start, I want to welcome everybody who's in the chat room. Um, by the way, if you'd like to be in the chat room, please do join. Um, the chat rooms are uh, patron only chat rooms. So if you join Patreon, you can go to all the eight lives per month for hangouts and for live shows, and it helps support the channel. Uh, otherwise, you could please just like and subscribe uh, and also hit the bell so you get notifications. And normally I say, hey, and if you want to support the channel, you can buy a book. But guess what? I just put up a bunch of my books for free, and I want to offer that to all my patrons and, and uh, subscribers. Um, now, mind you, they're, they're not the most expensive books in the world. So <laughs> I, I have self-pubbed them on Amazon, and they're at a very reasonable rate on Amazon anyway, a uh, very low rate. But hey, now they're free, so I wanted to offer them. And they'll be free through, I think it's Tuesday. So uh, jump on it. Um, uh, I have a couple, uh, four books. One is Only the Truth. This is a very popular book uh, with mystery readers. Um, and it's the... Um, it's a psychological mystery story, um, and uh, a lot of people love it. So I hope you do too. And all along with that, I'm also the I have the book Ten Missing and Murdered Children's Cases that have nothing to do with Madeline McCann. And that's a tongue-in-cheek book because every chapter I mention Madeline McCann because the whole point of the book is Madeline McCann gets so much publicity, and so many other missing children and murdered children do not get the publicity. But some people read the book and they're like, I don't know why she said it had nothing to do with Madeline McCann, because everything has to do with Madeline McCann. And then they give me one star. <laughs> oh, well, um, they missed the point. Uh, me, Abe, and Greyhound You is a fun short story, um, and it is actually based on a real life trip I took on Greyhound with an iguana. Yes, you heard me correctly. Uh, but how much of the story is actually based on what I? experienced and how much did I fabricate. Uh, and the last one is the truth about book publishing and book publicity. And that's just for all my um, writer friends out there who would like to publish a book and I don't want you being ripped off. So I wrote this book so people would understand how the publishing and pub publicity industry works. So you don't lose a whole heck of a lot of money. Um, and today you won't lose any money because it's free. Uh, links are below. All right, so now let's get to, oh, I want to say hello people in the in the chat room though. And again, it is a it is a patron only chat room. But after the show is done, the show is public to everyone. All right, let me see who's hanging out here just for a quick sec. All right, we've got who's in here. Annie Haley is here, um, and Christine is here, and BLW is here and says, "Never heard of the case. It should be interesting." Yeah, um, you know. I always say how I, I don't hear about a lot of cases myself. And this is a Baltimore case, Baltimore, Maryland. And I live 30 minutes from that location. And I still didn't hear about it. Um, so <laughs> Benny is here. And, th and thank you, Benny. I accidentally put this show on private, and, and, and which was not what I wanted to do, which keeps everybody out, including you guys. So thank you, Benny, for the warning. So I fixed it. Yes. All right. <laughs> Annie Haley's having Indian lunch and she didn't give me any. Yeah, I would love some of that. Uh, Lila is here. Oh, she's, everybody's got Indian food on the table. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I want some. Um, <laughs> let's see who else is here. Molly is here. Uh, let's see who else, who else, who else, who else. I'm quick, 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 quick. Gretchen is here. Alexandra is here. Lisa S is here. Oh, and she thinks this case is fascinating. So somebody has, you're familiar, Lisa, with this case. Um, and uh, Sheila says, I just want to say I love you Aww. and your show. I especially love your integrity. Thank you. Uh, because it's sorely lacking in our world today. Uh, thank you, Bunches. That's really nice. I, I try to stick with being ethical. Um, and sometimes I'm very outspoken about that. <laughs> and some people don't like it terribly much. And I'm not saying I'm, per I'm a perfect person. I, you know, I, I, I have my failures, which you're never going to find out about. <laughs> and, um, but I try. The two things I don't like is lying. Um, uh, 
all cheating. I don't like lying, cheating, and stealing. I, I find those things really frustrating because those are things you take away from other people. And I don't think you have the right to do that. And you, you ruin their lives while you're making your life better. And that's not right. So I have a big thing about that. Uh, Sandra is here. Scarlett is here. Waltzy Matilda is here. Oh, you're up. You're awake in uh, Sydney. All right. <laughs> Coffee and toothpicks. Woo. Yeah, that's a little early for you. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, Lin Linda is here from Big Bear Lake. Oh, yes. I've been to Big Bear Lake in California. Used to live in Long Beach. Um, let's see. Anybody else here? Leslie is here. Um, and Benny says... Uh, I'm not going to go to Benny's. Uh, I do uh, partially agree. I'm not going to put that on the screen yet because uh, you might take away all my thunder. Okay. Because <laughs> Benny's very smart. Uh, and I always think he does a great job profiling himself. So um, Midgey is here. And let's see uh, who else is here. I might be missing somebody. I'm going to have to. Nancy is here. And I don't want to keep going forever. Aunt Dini is here. And um there's so many people here. Emily is here. Helena is here. Never heard of the case, Helena says. Okay, CJ's here. All right, I'm going to have to stop. And if I missed your name, I'm so sorry. Um, and if you're coming into the chat room now, welcome. All right, let's get to this a very fascinating case. All right, first I want to show you, before I start, where I get my information from. Now, mind you, one of the things I always try to do, and I this is one of my ethical issues, um, I like to let people know where I get my information because if somebody's contributed to my knowledge, I want to put it out there. Um, I mean, I have to get my knowledge from someplace or, or my facts or <laughs> maybe not quite true facts, but information, shall we say. Um, I want people to know where I get it from. My analysis is based on things I have access to. It doesn't come out of nowhere. Um, so um, as an author of a number of books, um, when I wrote my book, Mur The Murder of Cleopatra, uh, my footnotes are like every page is, ton is tons of footnotes and there's an extremely long uh, bibliography because anytime I ran into something that I got from somebody else, I put that down there. In fact, if I took a paragraph out of somebody's book, which you're allowed to do, I mean, you know, it's just a paragraph, not their entire book, just a paragraph. Then you put that in the footnote and you put it in the bibliography to let people know and that's, that's proper academically to do so. So when you do that, then those people who are reading your book also can then go to all of your links, all of the, all of the footnotes in the bibliography, and they can learn for themselves what you what, where, where, it, where it came from. When I was studying to be a profiler, and I hope all of you take this into account if you are criminal justice students or anyone who is studying something, I would read a book, and I, then they would say, oh, I got this from... And they would say the note, whatever the bit was in the footnote. And I would go to Amazon and click on it and I'd immediately buy the book. And that would be my next book to read. And that's how I went through hundreds of books studying profiling because I kept clicking on whatever I saw in the footnotes in the bibliography. I learned so much that way because I went to the source. I appreciated what they had to say too. And their source in their, of their, in their own right. But I also could go to the other sources. So I always try to do that. And, and I will link those sources in in my description so that you can go there and you can see those things. Now, what what did, what did I use, you ask? <laughs> All right, I'm going to show you what I used. All right, so um, first one is uh, Unsolved Mysteries. It is, a, it is an episode called Mystery on the Rooftop. Um, and uh, they gave the description, after rushing from his home, Ray Rivera disappears. Days later, his car is found in a strange site at a, the, at a historic hotel triggers a baffling mystery. Okay. That is on Netflix. Um, I don't know if you can get it anyplace else. So if you don't have Netflix, not sure what you do, but you can watch it on Netflix. It is, uh, well-produced, but very agenda driven. Okay. That word mystery is right there on the thing. So they want to make sure they stick with the mystery and I'll explain that to you later. Uh, then I read this book, uh, Ray Rivera, Suicide or Homicide by a woman named Miriam Moya. And that is listed in Wikipedia as a great source. Um, and uh, Mir Miriam Moya goes into a whole bunch of very technical things, which I'll show you later, uh, about uh, the physics of, of the issue of how he ended up where he ended up. And um, that cost me $10. And first of all, I couldn't understand most of it. <laughs> because I'm not that bright in physics. And secondly, I thought her, her, her conclusion was ludicrous. 
don't spend the ten dollars really not worth it i spent it for you and i'll show you what she said and you don't need to buy the book all right um this book an unexplained death a true story of a body at the belvedere is by uh mikita brotman who actually lived there um and she became fascinated by the case because she was there when it happened and um excellent book excellent book and for a person who's not a profiler a forensic person totally impressed totally impressed and i'm going to show you some of the conclusions she came to which i give her a thumbs up on so really really happy with with her book so and by the way that one's 99 cents <laughs> you know don't buy the book that's 10 buy the one that's 99 cents and she does go into a lot of history and she goes into a lot of other cases have similarities um and and you know it's very if you if you like a lot of that kind of thing you're going to find it a pretty well written book uh because i was you know looking for the specific issues of this case i kind of did a skimmy thing but I, I think she writes well, and for many people, they would find the entire history and everything she includes quite interesting. So I highly recommend that book, and I'm not sure why it's just 99 cents. Personally, I think the, those prices are reversed on those two books. All right, so now, what the heck happened? All right, going, going to Wikipedia, which is, this is not one of the better Wikipedia articles. And again, I say to you, I'm only using this for because it gives me an outline. Um, and some of it is wrong, in my opinion, or well, it's, not, it's only wrong because certain people have pushed information there that have, has ended up there. But it's okay. It's a, it's a source. Okay? This is what happened. Uh, the body of Ray Rivera was found on May 24th, 2006, inside the historic Belvedere Hotel in Baltimore, Maryland. Now, just, just, just to stop, just to show you a little bit about um, this. This hotel is pretty darn cool. That's what I have to say. It's pretty darn cool. That's a Belvedere, you know. That's pretty awesome, and it's got quite a history. Um, it, 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 let us see if I can pick, just give you a, like a a minute on the history. Um, it's a a bow. I don't know. If, I guess it's bow arts. Never heard that term, but it's a bow art style building in Baltimore, Maryland, designed by a Boston architecture firm of Parker and Thomas, and built in 1902 to 1903. It's a landmark. And now it's no longer a hotel, it's a condominium, but they have some, still have some, you, you can have events there because uh, when you have the events, it looks, it looks like, this is the way the place looks on the inside. Woo, that is gorgeous. That's really gorgeous. And th this is a picture from back in the day. You see all those people lined up there at the Belvedere back in the day. Yeah, it's too bad it's not a, not a hotel anymore, but it's, it sure is gorgeous though. So you know, pretty cool, pretty cool place. And, um, and so in 1991, it was uh, converted to condominiums. And there you have it. So um, I just, I just want to check in. By the way, can everybody hear me clearly? Oh, <laughs> oh, it's interesting you point that out. Um, uh, Walter Matilda talk, is talk, talking about the woman who wrote the book I like. Didn't she hear a thud? Um, because uh, I'm going to explain how he ended up dead in this building. Um, supposedly nobody heard anything, but she claimed she remembered something, hearing something that night, uh, but tossed it off as, hey, it's it, for, for in Baltimore, you know what I mean? There's traffic going by and, you know, you hear noises all the time. So it didn't, it didn't really sink in. So, um, yeah. So, uh, but do, do, do just tell me if you can hear me properly. I, I, I changed out my microphone, so I, I forgot to ask you that because this is a new mic. So I want to be sure that you're hearing me and I'm not talking and, <laughs> and nobody's hearing me say anything. Let me know as I go on. Um, all right. So that, that's the Belvedere. And it, it's it's quite a st Sounds great. Okay. Don't everybody know. Nobody else has to answer. Thank you, Aunt Danny. <laughs> I appreciate that. Just want to check. Ah, everybody says they can hear me. Okay, I got it. <laughs> but you know, I've, I've done that where I've done a show for like 20 minutes. And then I look at the comments and people are like, I, 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 have you, is anybody hearing Pat talk? And I'm like, ah, God. <laughs> I came, I saw, I heard you. <laughs> Very good, BLW. Oh. All right, so that's the Belvedere in, in, in a nutshell. All right, so let's go back to what happened at the Belvedere at this point in time. So now we're talking about 2006. Um, and um, it says here, 
Although the event was ruled a probable suicide by the Baltimore Police Department, the circumstances of Rivera's death are mysterious and disputed. Oh, and by the way, in case you hear me say uh, the pronunciation of the this particular city in Maryland, you hear it two different ways, Baltimore and Baltimore. Um, the, the supposed proper name, I suppose, is Baltimore, and that's what everybody outside of Baltimore says. But most people who live in this area say Baltimore, Baltimore. So you'll you probably go back and forth depending on uh, my mood. <laughs> so somebody said the other day, I know you're a Marylander because you said Baltimore. Probably true. Um, so, so anyway, um, let's go on about who who is Ray Rivera first of all, and and you know we have to look into victimology. You know what kind of background does this fellow have? Who is he? Um, what kind of guy was he? And apparently a really nice guy. You know. So anyway, uh, this this is this is uh, Ray and his wife. Um, and let me let me just tell you basically about his background for a second here. Um, Ray Omar, Omar Rivera was born. Uh, in, he was born in Spain, I believe, uh, 1973. Um, at the time of his disappearance, he was a 32-year-old finance writer for the Oxford Club as a video contractor. Um, Rivera and his wife Allison had relocated from California to Baltimore to work for his longtime friend Porter Stansbury, and they met when they were like 15. Uh, I think they did. They were like they had so much in common, you know. So. They were like buds. And I understand that like, Ray Rivera did not want to write financial crap. He wanted to be a screenwriter. All right. Um, he went out to California with that hope, but he was like starving to death. And, you know, so his buddy said, hey, you know, I'm making a shitload of money. And why don't you come back to Baltimore? Join me. You can write. I know you don't know squat about finances and apparently you don't do well with money, but you're a good writer, so I'll give you, you know, information and you write it up. So he's like, you know, his wife is like, we gotta survive, you know. So they came here and they, and they got they got a lovely home. Um, where's their lovely home? Yeah, they bought a lovely home, and so now they're living there. Um, but six months before he died, um, he actually wasn't working for the company anymore. He's doing independent stuff. Um, so uh, his bu his buddy uh, was Porter Stansbury. A very, 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 very proper name. Uh, and he uh, ran Stansbury and Associates Investment Research, a subsidiary of Agora Publishing. And this is this this becomes an issue in a lot of theories. Rivera had stopped working for the company six months prior to his death, but according to Stansbury, did freelance work for another subsidiary of Agora Publishing. And one of the things you'll see when people try to connect dots is they'll take a dot that's over here and a dot that's over here and they'll find a way to connect those suckers, even if there's really not a good reason to connect them. So it's like saying, well, you know, um, uh, somebody was killed at, um, I'm trying to think of a location in Maryland. Um, <laughs> oh. You know, Maryland has this, is a weird place because, I mean, Maryland, we always, for those of us who live here, we think, you know, we're in the DMV, which is, District of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia. It's, it's what surrounds Washington, D.C. Because we're like, that's where we live. And then there's the Eastern Shore. And then you can go way out to this little point. It's like five five hours away. And um, so let's say a murder happens five hours away. And somebody goes, well, I think Pat Brown has been out there before. What's your point? It's five hours away. What do I have to do with what happens in that town? So these are the kind of things when people want to connect dots. They'll find a way. So anyway... That was what Ray was doing. Now, what happened to Ray? All right. So his wife goes out of town. She calls home. He doesn't answer. Um, and she calls. There's a there's a woman staying there, a friend of theirs. Uh, nothing, 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 nothing questionable going on there, by the way. So don't go there. Um, she's just temporarily staying there. And she's like, well, I heard Ray got this phone call and he like rushed out. Uh and but he's not back, and so the wife is like, oh, "That's kind of weird." And so anyway, the friend calls her at five, like five or six in the morning, and says, "Hey, he's not back." And now the wife gets panicked. She flies home, um, and he's missing. His car is gone. He's gone, and the family goes into action because he's he's missing. Um, so he left uh, Tuesday, uh, May sixteenth, at six p.m. He was known to have left the home to run 
Well, it says to run errands in his wife's car. I don't know what that means because we don't know that he was running errands. He just left in his wife's car. Um, he was wearing a pullover jacket, shorts, and flip-flops. Um, some of the, it's questionable how much that is accurate at the time that poster came out. But basically, supposedly, the the person who was staying in the house heard him answer a phone and go, ah, and then take off. And, and the flip-flops are an interesting point in this case um, because it is May. Um, it's warm enough in the area to wear flip-flops. I, quite frankly, wear, wear flip-flops anytime my feet aren't freezing. I own like 20 flip-flops. Uh, also known in Hawaii is slippers. Um, and you have slippers for all occasions. <laughs> you know, the around the house slippers, the walk in the yard slippers, and the go out for good occasion slippers. But if you're not from Hawaii, you don't know what I'm talking about. But that he wore some flip-flops is not unusual, but it does. It did impact some of people's attitudes about how the how the how what happened to him could have happened. All right, so a family is now searching for this guy. Can't find him. All right, like what the heck happened to him? So the family goes out. They're they're, they're looking for the they're looking for him. They're looking for the car. And one day, some the, the I think it's his mother that actually looks over and says, "Oh my God, there's his car," and the car is found in a parking lot near the Belvedere. Now it's a condo, but it's the original Belvedere Hotel. It's near this location. And so it's in the parking lot. Now, mind you, the Agora company is also in that area. So the question is, why was he going there? Was he going to meet somebody after that phone call? Was it from the company he worked for? Uh, did something? Did he meet the person and something happened? What's going on here? But his car is found there, but he's not there. They search and search and search, and they still don't find him. Now, so this, this is just, this is just you know, so sad when, when the friends and family they're going like they're looking everywhere, and you know the police. Some people are like downing the police is like, well, you know, they should be searching harder. They should have looked here and there, and they're doing some effort of that. But you know, he's a grown man. It's the old turn thing. He has a right to go where he wants to go. But when his car is found, it's a little more questionable that. Where is he? But the friends and family are fanning out through the neighborhood. And I think they did a grand job. And some of the friends went to this parking garage. Let me see if I got the right picture. No, that's the old picture. Sorry about that. Let me go to the parking garage. Okay, here we go. All right. So this is, this is the Belvedere. And you see there's a parking garage next to the Belvedere. So they went up onto the roof of this parking garage. They, they were looking on all floors of the parking garage to see if, if he was there. You know, I guess uh, Baltimore is a bit of a rough city. Let's, let's face it. Um, uh, you know, it, it's really sad because it has such a neat feel to it and very different from Washington, DC. Washington, DC originally was very much the governmental city. It was really quite frankly, boring as hell until it ran. It just, they, until it's got its, um, I don't know. It got rehabilitated, and uh, and and suddenly the architecture improved, and we got we got all these different areas where we have restaurants and cultural things, and it's it's a cool city now. Um, but it was never very much of what I considered a dangerous city. I would go anywhere in Washington D.C., even as a private investigator at the time, and not be worried where I went. Baltimore, I'm like, yeah, I don't want to go there <laughs> because it was it had great neighborhoods and great food. The food was used to be way better in Baltimore than DC, especially the Italian neighborhoods. And, mm -mm. But it's a little, a little questionable. And if you've ever seen The Wire, the, 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 the television show, The Wire, and if you haven't seen The Wire, you have missed one of the best shows ever put on television. Watch The Wire, and that is Baltimore. Um, so there's great people in Baltimore, no question. And there's great culture in Baltimore. And I do go there, but sometimes when I go there, I'm like, and the last time I went there to watch Hamilton with my daughter, considering she has a federal license for carrying a, a firearm. Um, it was on the front seat when we were driving out <laughs> because we don't want to get carjacked. Anyway, so I know folks in Baltimore, you're all mad at me now, but hey, you know, you know what I'm talking about. So, and I love, I love you guys. And I just hope everything improves Really, I do, because it's a great town. Anyway, so they're looking through all these different places because you never know. He could have been, he could have been robbed. He could have been stabbed to death. Something could have gone wrong. And so they go up. Uh, in this parking garage, and then they look over see, over the edge toward the building. And what they see is when they look down, they see a hole in the roof of this building. Now, they might not have paid much attention, but
but they actually saw one of his flip flops, one of his slippers next to the hole. And I, and his also, by the way, his phone was there as well and his glasses. But I mean that they saw that and said, holy crap. So they told the police and the police went in to the building to see what was going on. And um, let me explain what happened when they got there. All right. <sighs> Let's see. All right. So they found. So R Rivera's co-workers, friends, whatever you want to call it, uh, went to the top of a parking structure near where the car was discovered and noticed a hole in the roof. Police soon discovered Rivera's partially decomposed body inside the conference room underneath the hole in the roof. Okay, so this is the hole in the roof. Okay, this is what it looks like from below. Well, it's kind of a crappy picture, but you see the sky there. All right, and he is found here in this conference room. It's kind of an unused room. So he's crashed through the ceiling. He's crashed through here, the roof. Crashed through the ceiling. And now he's lying on the floor. But it's been a while, so he's decomposing rapidly and it's quite unpleasant. Um, so they find him there. And he has got a lot of injuries to his body. And the injury thing is, is, is there's a lot of argument over the injuries as to... Um, if he came back, if he crashed through that roof, would he have these kind of injuries or wouldn't he? Uh, I'm going to do a basic explanation of that, but I'm I'm going to say right now that there's so many different opinions on this, but I'm going to get to the point where this is what matters and this is, you know, some things don't matter. Okay. So anyway, he's found. Now he's found dead. All right. Now, the police department, the Baltimore Police Department, look at this case. And they quickly rule it a suicide. Now, uh, the medical examiner rules it undetermined. And you and you might ask, well, if it's undetermined, then hey, you know, they did not, it's actually not a suicide. Well, the reason that the, the medical examiner did that was because although it seemed clear he came, it seemed clear, and I'm going to point this out because other people think it's not clear that he came through the roof. If he crashed through the roof, and ended up dead on the floor. Under most circumstances, we're talking suicide. How else would he get there? How else would he come crashing through a roof off the top of a building? You know, I mean, so, but the medical examiner decided that there wasn't absolute proof that it was a suicide at that point. Could have been a homicide. Could have been maybe an accident. So, so it was written down as undetermined. And this fellow, you'll see him in the in, in, in the documentary. His name is, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Michael Bear. He is the only detective in the Baltimore Police Department who decided this was a homicide. He, the family definitely believed it was a homicide because, you know, this is what happens quite often. It's like families don't want to believe their loved one came to a, just a stupid end through suicide or accident. So they're like, yeah, somebody killed him. Now they have this, They since the Baltimore Police Department put ended up with, they said suicide, quickly. And the family thought way too quickly. And then the medical examiner said determined. And then you have this one guy who says, hey, it's a homicide. And he worked and worked and worked on this case. He was obsessed with it. And um, he ended up in the movie, I mean, I'm sorry, the documentary, Unsolved Mer Mysteries, um, as the main guy in there. Because again, what, do, what does media love? A good mystery. They don't care necessarily about the truth. They want a good mystery. And if the mystery happens to be the truth, that's fine. If the mystery isn't the truth, they don't really give a crap. Okay. They're going to go with whatever makes money. Um, yes, media, I'm talking about you. Okay. So this guy says, Hey, I don't think it's a homicide. I think, I don't think it's a suicide. I don't, I think it's a homicide. So now I'm going to go on to how the heck did he end up there? This is a very, this is this is where things get very tricky, okay? And just before I go there, I just want to see what some of your comments are um, before I go on to the issues of how did he end up in that spot, crashing through the roof? All right, so let's see. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, aw, Linda, I'm feeling back in college in my favorite class with my favorite professor. Oh, that's so cool. I'm glad. You know, I... As I say over and over, this is an educational channel. I do like to approach this as a professor uh, because I like teaching. 
Um, I didn't like teaching in college because <laughs> it kind of sucked there. <laughs> but here I have more freedom <laughs> to do what I actually want to do. And I have better students. Well, let me tell you, I do. Um, so, um, but I like to take people through the thinking process because to me, the thinking process is the most important thing that you can go through. Because if you don't have that, what's the point of the rest of it? It's just gossip and guesswork. And how does that help you out? Even in normal life, how does that help you? So, um, okay, I want to point out what Strega has to say. Uh, Maria, I can't pronounce her name, Donheimer, agrees that some of Ray's injuries don't appear to be the result of an individual who, individual who suffered an 11 to 14 story fall. Okay, so here's where we get into the... Is it Occam's razor or is it a rabbit hole? And one of the problems we have with experts in general, include, including myself, I'm not going to take myself out of the picture, although I'm always right. <laughs> so somebody actually asked me that the other day, somebody who didn't like me. Do you, are you, do you think you're always right? And do you ever apologize for being wrong? No, I don't think I'm always right. And I have been wrong. Yes, because there's no point. In, you know, if you're, if you're like, man, I, I screwed that one up. And then we learn from it. I, I saw the, I say the greatest, the greatest line I ever heard on Chopped, because I like Chopped, the cooking show. The guy said, if you win, it's great. And if you lose, you learn. And if you learn, you win. I'm like, oh, that is cool. That's a great, that's a great saying. And it's true, because even experts learn. And we learn from our mistakes sometimes. We learn from other experts. And we learn as we get more and more into a field. We spend more time studying. And we're like, one day we open up a book, or we listen to an expert, and we go, Ah, crap. I had that wrong for the last 10 years. <laughs> you know, that's life. I mean, we learn. So, uh, but, um, so yes, there, this, I'm going to get into some of the issues of, let me, let me put what you said right here. Uh, some of Ray's injuries don't appear to be the result of an individual who suffered an 11 to 14 story fall. Now keep that in mind. And this is, this is a good point. Keep it in mind when you look for an alternative theory, which I'm going to get into. If he didn't suffer the injuries from falling, where did he get the injuries from? And then how did he end up in the room below the hole in the ceiling? And we're going to get to that one. Um, uh, and Shrake also says, uh, Donheimer is a certified medical illustrator and attended Johns Hopkins University for her training. That is excellent. Doesn't necessarily mean you're right. Um, I have disagreed with FBI profilers who will claim that they had more training than me and perhaps they're correct. Doesn't mean they're right. On the other hand, I'm, I have more training and more experience than many people, including armchair profilers, but you know, that doesn't mean an armchair profiler can't be right and be nail it better than I do. I mean, that's just that, that, so we have to say, if you look at a trial, you've got experts on two sides, the prosecution expert, and the defense expert, and they disagree. Well, one, both of them have doctorates. They're doctors of something or other, or they're doctors of, med of psychology or medical something, and forensics, and they disagree. So how is that possible? Well, either one, either there can be two different opinions, or one of them is a lying dog for the money, uh, or <laughs> one of them just wrong. They aren't as good as they think they are. Lots of possibilities, but I, I'm glad you pointed that because we're going to talk about that in a bit. Um, oh, oh, okay. Stephanie says, I only know the unsolved mysteries segment on this case, so I don't know how much of that information is real or not. I'm going to point that out. And um, it's, it's funny because I found this immediately and so did Benny. I didn't get to respond to you, Benny, but you found the same thing I found, which was great information. I'm going to talk about that. Um, Sandra says, I wear flip-flops almost all year long. For winter, I have flip-flop socks. <laughs> you know, I could live in those things. I swear to God, I hate putting shoes on my feet. I mean, if I'm playing table tennis, I'll put shoes on my feet. Take, pick a ball, put shoes on my feet. Hiking, I'll put shoes on my feet. But freaking everything else, I, I don't like shoes. I want my flip-flops. I love them dearly. I do. I have many of them. Okay. And, and the cheap ones, by the way. Don't get the big ones with the big fat bottoms and all the, they cost you $35. No, no, no. You want the little thin ones, you know, get a whole bunch of different colors. And, you know, when they rip up, you just chuck them, but they're actually much more comfortable in my opinion than the expensive things. Anyway. All right. <laughs> Let's see what else you have to say. Uh, 
Hey, Martin. Glad you're here, Martin. All right. Uh, Martin's going to give us, I know, a few jokes, and I always appreciate them. Um, seriously, what? I uh, wish, <laughs> VLW, I wish it was aerial drone footage. I struggle to visualize things from verbal descriptions. I'm going to give you some pictures in a minute, okay? They're not quite droney, but I'll give you some pictures. So hang in there. All right. What was the cause of death? Massive crushing of body. Basically, every part of his body got that way. All right. Oh, thank you, Andini. You've taught me to look at things logically and rationally. That's what I hope to do. And that to be beneficial to any work you're in, any part of your life you're in, helps to be logical. All right. So, all right. This is an interesting question. I'm going to answer this one. Gretchen comes up with a good point. How would his flip-flop cell phone and glasses be located next to the hole in the roof? Wouldn't it be more likely that they would be near his body? I will answer that in a bit. All right. So let's see. Uh, I'm not sure I understand that one, so I can't answer it. <laughs> I knew you were going to say something, Martin. Drinking expensive tequila and wearing cheap flip-flops. Hey, I know where to put my money, you know? I do. I know where to put my money. I'm happy to pay $4.99 on a pair of slippers, but I'm going to spend 40 bucks, 50 bucks on a, on a bottle of tequila. And no folks who keep, some of my haters keep saying, well, she's just a freaking drunk. No, <laughs> I'm actually not a freaking drunk. I deny that. All right. All right. <laughs> I need to contribute my expert analysis instead of clowning around all the time. But we like your clowning, Martin. Okay. So here we go. Let's go to the theories about how he ended up crashing through a hole in the roof or did he crash through a hole in the roof okay let's, let's go there because there's issues over that all right so i'm going to show you those pictures that you're looking for that give you some idea of what it looks like all right all right so here is a theory number one um and this is from the show this is from unsolved mysteries so uh the theory number one is that he 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 ran and jumped off the roof and uh, like that you see and it's a, and it's quite a ways down which would account for the injuries and account for the fact he kind of went through the roof like a bullet um a traject you know trajectory um when he hit the roof because it wasn't a really wide thing you know wide hole so you know basically his body was almost streamlined as he went through that spot and quite a distance so that he would definitely die when he when he hit that roof, and he'd definitely be dead when he hit the um, into the when he landed on the floor in the conference room. No question about it. So this is one of the theories uh, that we have. All right, let me show you a picture here. All right, uh, the roof does not have any kind of barricade to keep him from jumping off the roof. All right, and there's a reasonable amount of area, 45 feet, where he can run. Because the concept is, in order to end up where he ended up, let me go back to the other picture. Uh, he had to kind of, it kind of had to go out and then down. All right, and so there has to be a reasonable amount of uh, 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 horizontal movement before the vertical movement. And this is what gets people very, very, hey, hey, this can't happen. All right, so, so here we, oops. Here we go. So he, so he could, so theoretically, he has to run and and catapult himself off the roof. So he run, 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 and then he jumps off the roof like. And by the way, um, I I was a major failure. You know what? What do you call that thing? That the what, what jump is it? Okay, tell me, folks. What is that when you, you know, you're in high school and the major you do that stupid jump? You have you stand and then you have to do that jump. And what's that thing called? Because I made it like one foot. <laughs> I got, I got a D in gym. <laughs> I mean, I could do I could do martial arts, table tennis, and pickleball, but frick, I couldn't do gymnastics and I couldn't jump. So um, what is that thing? Broad jump? Is that a broad jump? The long, the long jump. The long jump. No, not a pole vault. I didn't have a pole. Long jump. It could be the long jump. And I am amazed when you're looking at um when you look at that at the Olympics, it's like holy crap. How could they jump that far? They're like, it, it, it boggles my mind. I just jump like, <laughs> it looked, I look ridiculous. It was embarrassing. Stand, standing long jump. Okay, 
there's two kinds. And I guess standing long jump and running long jump. Hmm. Wow. All right. All right. Uh, the picture made you dizzy. Yep. Um, oh, but this is a good point. Antini says he was a swimmer. Maybe he ran and dove as you would into a pool. Um, he was an athletic enough fellow. Okay. He wasn't a couch potato. He was a tall guy. Um, he had, he had good strength. He'd been an athlete all his life. So he had more ability to jump than a, perhaps an average person. Um, and would he dive? Um, possibly. I, I mean, I'm going to tell you how well I can understand this crap later, just to be real realistic. Um, and I want to point out, uh, let's see. Okay, Lisa S. I'm going to get to this, Lisa S. I think he met someone on the roof for a chat. It became violent. He was thrown. It was common for workers, et cetera, to go to the roof to talk, lunch, ciggies, serve coffee, et cetera. Let me say this right now. There's no way he was thrown off the roof um, and landed where he did. The only way he was went off that roof was to do a running long jump, essentially. He could not have just been pushed off the roof or gotten for argument and thrown off the roof. It, quite frankly, is not possible to end up where he ended up. So um, I, I've seen the sketch of his injuries. I have seen that. Um, and and there's, I say, there's arguments over the injuries, but the, the, I'm going to tell you why things, certain things are important and certain things aren't. You're going to see this by the end of the show. Okay. And this is why Elkham's Rain, uh, Razor versus Rabbit Hole is very important here. Um, let's see. Uh, so, uh, so let me go on to explain a little more of this. Okay. <laughs> That's a good point. I wouldn't get near enough to the roof edge to throw anyone off. It's, it's a scary roof edge, but the, the important thing about the roof edge, yes, it's scary. And supposedly his wife said he was scared of heights. Okay. But let's look again at the roof edge. There are no impediments to being able to run and throw yourself off, run and jump like a son of a gun. There's no impediments. And that's important to understand just because it's important to understand. All right. Now, one of the reasons people think it's impossible is because of the distance between the roof edge and where he landed. They're like, there's hell no way he can do this. And I'm going to explain that in a little bit. All right. Let's go to uh, another theory. Um, the other theory is he went out on this ledge and they jumped from there and it looks better. But one of the things that document does show quite well is this ledge where it looks really good in this picture is a crappy little ledge that's hard to move on first of all he has to get out one of the windows which means he has to know somebody who lives there uh, and go out their window get onto this freaking ledge and then which is actually quite narrow it's it's, it's a weird picture and it's it's like it's like um not flat so it's, it will be quite impossible to actually run and jump and have any velocity at all so this most everybody Everybody says that's not where he went off. Okay. Let's look at the, another area where people think he went off. There's a theory he jumped off the 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 um parking garage. Remember the parking garage? That's where they the, the friends looked over and saw him down, saw the hole down there. Parking garage. But now look at this problem. Do you look look at the parking garage and do you see the wall? So there's a large wall there. And uh, he would have to get get back, go back from the wall. He'd have to run like a son of a gun. And then I guess he'd have to step onto the wall and push himself off the wall, catapult himself off the wall. And that seems a little unlikely he would be able to do that. Unlikely. Okay. Uh, let me, okay. This is somebody, this is Makita Brotman. This is the book I like, Down Explained Death. Okay. Um, I like this woman a lot and, and, you know, I don't have to be the only person out here who I, I know who said that, oh, I'm so logical. I think so well. I'm such a good profile. I am fine with other people being good, at, being good at that. I mean, I'm excited because my God, if everybody was good at profiling and crime scene analysis, I would have no objection to the civilian jury system. I'd say, bring them on, but they're not as, common as all that. So when I see somebody who's really good, I want to, I want to say, Hey, this person, this person's really smart. And, uh, I don't care if she's not a profiler. She should be. All right. So she said, however, from the, uh, from the 
damn it, I have my camera over there again. Uh, anyway, running and jumping. Oh, however, a run and jump from the top of the parking lot would be impossible as it is surrounded on all sides by a wall of at least four feet. So, yeah, th <laughs> you'd have to be Superman to pull this one off. So I agree. I don't think it could have jumped off the parking, parking lot thing. Now, this is another point of the parking lot. 20 feet down and 20 feet over. So the, co the comment here is even if he could get over that damn wall, he wouldn't, that's not that high up. 20 feet, oh, he would not have hit that at such a rate that he would have crushed through and had that much damage. So that just seems incredibly, un that just doesn't even make sense um, that that's how he would have gotten through the hole. In other words, the, the police believed and that he came from a height that whew, was strong enough that he smashed through there and died. And if he had jumped in some other way, he probably would not have had that happen. So, so we, we, we are pretty much, the theory is this is eliminated because it just, it's, he'd have to get out there and there's no proof that he could get through the windows and it still doesn't make a lot of sense. And then this one being able to run and jump over the wall doesn't make any sense. So those two theories are out, which leaves us with this, I'm oh, sorry, not that theory, this theory. All right. From the rooftop which he would have act, he would be able to run at full speed and jump off. Now, now he has one broken, uh, one of his flip flops is broken. It's like pulled up and God knows how many times I have had one of my pairs of flip flops that I adore. You know, you wear them long enough and you like trip on them. Uh, you run into something and it rips and you're like, dang it all. And you try to shove the, that one side, you know, cause you got the two things and you try to shove it back in through the rip. And then you hope that it's going to hold. And then you take a few steps and it pulls back out. You're like, all right, all right, I have to, I have to toss this. Um, it's very easy to do that. Um, so the question people have is if he ran on this rooftop, was he running in the flip-flops? And then did the flip-flop break when like when he, when he tried to jump off or when he hit something, did one flip-flop break? Um, in my opinion, no, it is not real easy to run in flip-flops. I find that kind of unlikely because I mean, I wear them all the time. So I know that there's limits. If I wear a tape, if I wear tennis shoes, I can walk faster than I, if I wear flip-flops. I can run in tennis shoes. I don't usually run in flip-flops. I mean, they're your, they're, they're your, they're your relaxed uh, footwear, you know? Um, however, what I have done with flip-flops when I need to move quicker, can anybody guess what I actually do with flip-flops when I need to move quicker or when I, what do you think? What do you think I would do if I got to I got to take off and run? What do you think I'm going to do? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Streg is a mind stuck to the pavement once on a hot day. You can melt those suckers. You can. That is absolutely true. Um, so if I want to run, thank, 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 thank you, Sky Ricky. Take them off. I have done this, and this is where I just want to point out. Yes, this is. Yep. Yeah, um, Take them off and run barefoot, says Emily. Very good. Now, if you don't wear flip-flops, you don't know what we're talking about. But if you wear them, um, that's what you do. I mean, of course, you have to have a location which is fun to wear. You know, it's not fun, but it's not unpleasant to take them off. If you're walking through a, a whole pile of gravel, it doesn't, you really don't want to take them off. But if you've got flat, flat land in front of you, flat surface, you just pull them off your feet and you run. Now, he, I, in my opinion, he could have done one of two things. One of the things could be is as he was thinking about whatever he was thinking about, he actually broke one of them. Like it's easy to trip on them. And then, you know, maybe you're getting excited. You move too fast and he already broke one. He went, ah, crap. And he took them off his feet and he ran, or he just took them off his feet and he ran. Um, but that could be one of the reasons that um, he was able to run. And the flip-flops were found, um, you know, on, on the roof, on the, uh, the, where the hole was. So maybe they weren't on his feet. Maybe they're in his hand. Hard to say. Hard to say. Um, uh, Dean, Dean says the hole was so small. It's not that small. And this is where people again start going down that rabbit hole. It was big enough for his body to go through. He had to go down feet first together or dove it. Correct. He didn't go in like this. He went in either feet first or he went in diving. Yes, that's correct. Um, 
But if you're going from a great height, that is not unlikely that that is what will happen. So nobody ever, the, the physics of it, he could definitely go through that hole. It wasn't that he couldn't, that couldn't have happened. <laughs> D flip and run. D flip. I haven't heard that term. We'll make it a new one. We will. Um, could he have, oh, could he have tossed a flip flop over to watch it land? I don't, that's an interesting point. How, like how some gun shot suicides will fire the gun one time first. Stephanie, I like this. I, I don't know it's true, but I like your thinking because you should, when you're analyzing any case, you should be willing to step aside and say, could you have done this? And um, I would, you know, if I were working this case, you know what I would do? I would test that. I would. I'd take it off and I'd pitch it. And if it could go 45 feet and land, and it might, might be something I would consider as a possibility. So it's a very good thought. Very good thought. Um, I like it. I like your thinking. Um, okay. Born a Hawkeye. Hello. If you're in fear of your life, you don't think you just run. If being threatened with a weapon, which is worse, run. Well, if you're on a rooftop that you're going to fall off of, I don't know. Running is the brightest thing to do. Um, and there's no, at this point, there's no evidence anybody threatened him. So we're going to have to, we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, um, <laughs> Lisa S. says, maybe this can help us understand the Japanese toilet case. Hey, guys, if you don't understand what we're talking about, put in profiler, Pat Brown. Oh, I don't even know what you put there. Toilet? Just put toilet in. Um, and check my check my playlist. Uh, that's a bizarre case. And, and it's it's very, that one's harder to understand, in my opinion, than this one. All right. So let's go forward with a little bit more now. All right. So we've got, we've got this concept where I believe if you're going to pick a went off the roof, concept. All right. The only one that actually holds water is this one that he had enough running room and could go off the roof. That, that's at this point, the only thing that holds water. Now let's go further though, because there's other issues here. Let's see. What are my other issues? Okay. Hold on. I can't see my stupid little pictures. Okay. We already saw the stupid little picture. Okay. Okay. We did that one. We did that one. Okay. All right. Now <laughs> the $10 book, she does physics, massive amount of physics, trying to, she does not believe he could have run and jumped off the building. So she puts, I just want to show you what she has in the book so you can not spend $10. Unless you're a physics person, I freaking don't know what she's talking about. There's a whole lot of equations here. And quite frankly, I, uh, I suffered through um, the first level of algebra and I quite frankly didn't do well in science. Um, and the bottom, it says the function that relates the mod modulus of the velocity V and the angle six, which forms the direction of, she's talking about velocity. I don't know what she's talking about. So I'm just going to show you what's in the book so you don't have to do it. All right. Now what she says here, one can doubt the conjectures, someone's personal opinion, the assumptions based on simple visual recognition, but the numerical and otherwise logical, logical only if you believe that her, her math and conclusions physics uh, and physics are true. Um, results of all these formulas, formulas, formulas don't always prove everything. Okay. Um, formulas that are applicable, applicable to the fall of an object or body cannot be questioned. Well, hell yeah, they can be questioned. That's what science is about. Formulas aren't always accurate. You can't question a formula. You can. I don't know what kind of scientist you are, but formulas can be questioned. All right. According to the distance, the measurements, the force, and another series of parameters, science allows us to find out with what specific characteristics that fall occurred. There is nothing else. There were several options. After being intensely studied, it has been proved impossible that Ray Rivera, and I'm not going to go the rest, of, or anybody else, leaped off the roof. So here's her theory, which is always interesting to me because she goes through all the physics and then she comes up with a theory to me, which is ridiculous. <laughs> so anyway, her theory is this. This is his body and he, the, the, the injuries on his body, she says, are caused by a car hitting him. Okay. So now think about this. She's saying he somehow ended up on the rooftop. Remember the rooftop? Okay, we're over the rooftop, right? He's on this rooftop and this person with a vehicle for whatever reasons we don't even have a clue of decided to hit him. So they ran into him. 
somehow being able to accelerate at a hell of a high speed in a very small area. And they were able to hit him. And by doing so, they were able to push him over the edge. He slid off the car and flew 45 feet because the car hit him at such a high rate of speed that could do this. And the car itself was able to stop on a dime and not run into the big freaking wall. <sighs> I lost $10. <laughs> I'm like, that doesn't make any sense at all. Now, one of the other very interesting things about this theory, because other people have the theory too, uh, they're saying that, that because they, they had these certain injuries, that this car, a car hit him and gave him those injuries because he couldn't have gone, the, he, the injuries he, that he had couldn't have happened from going through the hole. Then they say he's up on the rooftop and a car hits him, gives him those injuries, but then he goes through the hole. Wait a minute. Then he has two sets of injuries. He has the car injuries and he has the hole injuries. So now you can't say he couldn't have had those injuries going through the hole at all. It only had the car injuries. If he went through the hole, he had to have the hole injuries too. So this, this is where it gets very convoluted. And um, so you know how they start solving that problem. Then they start saying, ah, he didn't go through the hole at all. He was hit by the car, but he didn't go through the hole. Then the whole thing was staged. Yes, it was. And that's what she says. It's staged. So, so, what? So anyway, um, so either, <laughs> either he got hit by the car and somehow the car catapulted him over the wall and the car didn't hit the wall and he still went through the, through the hole. So he still got those other injuries. And by the fact, they say they didn't hit and, and therefore that's why his other items were there. And that's why the hole existed. But there are other people who say that the hole, and he never ever went through the hole. I'm going to give you an explanation. I'm going to give you a scenario. You want to hear a scenario? Now, remember, remember his buddy who he worked for his childhood buddy. Yeah. Uh, Porter. Okay. So his claim is this. Who better to sacrifice your childhood buddy who is naive enough to believe he get to be in a cool club? Someone close to Porter. Someone close to Porter. So Porter was persistent. He wanted to work with Ray. So Ray is introduced to some club and not knowing why he's really there, thinking he's going to get to the network to network to get his writing career going. So then he does a dirty job for Porter, proving his loyalty. He gets promoted to the next level. So I'm going to get into the whole issue of this, this game concept. He writes a speech about how the game, the dirty job or whatever, was successful and sums up his inspiration. All right, but hold up. Ray isn't there to make it to the highest levels. So one night, Porter calls him and says, hey, buddy, tonight's the night you're getting initiated. Drop everything you're doing. Come to the Belvedere Hotel. Remember, he got this phone call and he left. So he goes to the Belvedere Hotel. Ray hangs up and does exactly that. The hole on the rooftop has already been made. Now, the, mind you, the hole is clearly from something catapulting down through. So prior to the that night, somebody went and somehow managed to make a, a hole look just like a body would have catapulted through it. Um, Porter beats him to death and or pushes him from a different height in a different location. <laughs> so he didn't go through the hole, you see. The hole was already made. And then he like pitched him off someplace else and got damaged. And then he carried him over to where that is, you see. And later places his body under the hole. So somehow Porter has access to this entire building, goes into this conference room, knows there's a hole there because they put it there, puts his body under the hole. Then he puts some blood around the hole, you know. Yep. And then, then he takes his glasses, flip flops and phone. And he puts them up onto, put through the hole, you see. 
And then he put, takes one of the flip-flops and rips it. So it'll look like he ripped it running. What? <laughs> okay. I mean, that's off of Reddit. So it's some idiot. But anyway, he's coming up with a theory. But this is the whole point. And I thought, so I'm going I shouldn't call the guy an idiot. He's making, he's making up a story. I don't know if he's doing it jokingly or whatever. Uh, I hope so. Because if you're not doing that jokingly, mm, you got some work to do on your brain. Anyway, so somebody hits him with a car. Then they're going to carry his body in and put it in this conference room at the top of the building. Because it's, you know, remember, he jumps off. And so he's going to be in this. This ends up in this conference room because he went through the roof. And then how is how if they put him there, how's the hole get there? How does this stuff get outside the hole? I mean, who who does all this work? Because if you hit him with a car, just drive away. <laughs> it's easier. You don't have to pretend he got a suicide. You can just pretend somebody is a hit and run. It's much easier. Hey, and it's Balmer. Just stab him on the street. That happens. And somebody will say, Wow, well, man, it was a robbery gone wrong. This, this violent Baltimore, you know, he just got stabbed. You, you're not going to have to put together this fake suicide thing. It's just this is the kind of stupid rabbit hole stuff that just gets out of hand. So that's just nonsensical. So, no, this was not a stage crime scene. Now, some people say, why then did his phone end up without damage? Why did his, um, his glasses not get damaged? Well, if, you, if you're catapulting off someplace, the question is, where were those things at the time you were falling? Because when you make impact or prior to when you're making impact, you know, we think weird stuff happens. Let me tell you that weird stuff happens. They, they could have been in a pocket that just didn't fall out to right before he got there. And so they fell and didn't ha have much of a impact. He could have had them in his hand, gotten all the way down there and finally let them go right before he hit, hit the spot. And they just tumbled and just got lucky. They didn't get damaged. But nobody's going to nobody's going to stage that. That's just stupid. So one of the problems with people and rabbit holes is that they don't understand how criminals think. That is not the way anybody's going to stage a crime. So no, no, nobody staged it by hitting him with a car and then carrying him there and putting him there or throwing him off a building and carrying him to that location and putting him there, hoping they'll never get seen and nothing will ever go wrong. It just doesn't make any sense. And the hole cannot be produced in that you know it's just dumb but let me show you one other theory this is a, speaking of dumb all right so this is another theory um this is his buddy okay so the theory is uh this guy is a high roller um he, he's ridden in uh he's ridden in private helicopters before so the theory could be that a helicopter came over the belvedere and dropped him that eliminates the problem of him jumping off a roof, right? Okay. Um, first of all, you would think somebody noticed that helicopter came right over the roof of the Belvedere. Uh, secondly, um, he drove to the Belvedere. Where His car was there. Where? Oh, oh I see. What are you going to say? Let's see. He drove someplace else. The helicopter picked him up, and then somebody else drove his car to the Belvedere. And then the helicopter drove him over the and dropped him there. <sighs> no. How how about this theory? You got a helicopter. You drop the, the you drop him in the water because Baltimore is right near water. You've got you've got lots of water right outside, and then you've got the and if you go a little further. Um, Pass Annapolis, you go go over, you know, you got the Chesapeake Bay. No, this is Chesapeake Bay. And then you've got other bays. Come on now. And then you got the ocean. Cripe sakes. You just dump them in the water with a weight on them, you know, never to be seen again. Leave his car there and they'll think he ran off. Wouldn't that be smarter instead of trying to get him into the. See, this is, these are silly theories. So the theory that's left is. What the Baltimore police said to begin with, he jumped off a building. Now let's go. Let's go and take a look at this theory of jumping off the building. All right. Um, all right. So let, let Makita Bartman, the good book, says while others may disagree, I believe the circumstances of Ray Rivera's death make it impossible for anyone else to have been directly involved. Notwithstanding rumors to the contrary, I could find no evidence that any of the Agora's principals, not even Porter Stansbury by the way, it was out of town, 
had ever planned or carried out an assassination. Absolutely. There's no evidence whatsoever. I'll get, I'll, I'm going to get into a little bit uh, in a minute from the prosecutor's podcast just to show you some of the, uh, the, the actual facts. Um, this, again, is the roof that she thinks he jumped off of. The physics show that Rivera must have taken a running jump. When someone leaps from a height, they can travel a significant horizontal distance, even without a running start, if their initial velocity is strong enough. So there's a, there's a, there's a whole thing about jumping and gravity, which takes you in a weird, it's a weird thing. And there are, there are instances where people thought the person like jumped straight down, but then they ended up much, much farther out than they would ever have thought possible. So there's something about the whole methodology and the physics of running and leaping or just even jumping that aren't quite what us mere mortals uh, who do not study physics understand. So was it possible for him to leap off that roof and end up where he did? And the answer to that is yes. All right. Um, so let's go back to his house. So let's, let's go with, okay, then he jumped. Why would he jump? And so this is, this is a contentious issue. Happy guy. Love, Loved his wife, wanted to have children. She says, and 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 when you watch the um uh the documentary, you gotta like the wife. She's, I mean, she she she's torn up over this. His whole family's torn up over. It. They loved this guy. They did, and she's just. I mean, it's it's sad. It really is. It's sad, and it's also very hard to ever accept that your loved one chose or ended up doing something to harm themselves rather than somebody else did it to him. If somebody else did it to him, you can say, okay, well, there's, there was nothing we could do about it. But when somebody does something to themselves, it's very hard for family to accept that they either missed the signs or they couldn't stop them, or they just can't believe the person would even do that to them when they loved them. Why would you do that? So, so back at the house, and this is his wife, this is Alison Rivera. Um, and it says here, um, one of the things she says during the film is that during the documentary, she sp speaks so highly of him and being such a great guy and he's, he has no psychological problems, he, nothing wrong. They did have a few incidents of an alarm going off and he he did come out with a bat when the alarm went off, seemed kind of freaked. Um, she admits a few things, but then she's, she, she doubles down on, oh, the guy's, the guy's he's perfectly psychologically healthy. Now, uh, apparently he was had some issues before, this was going on. He was concerned about what he was writing in this, this newspaper, uh, this, this stuff he was writing that maybe people were uh, financially getting bad tips and he didn't even know, you know, whether he was giving good tips or not, you know, because he was just, just the writer. For a while, Allison is seriously worried about the complex mess Ray seemed to have gotten himself into and the toll it was taking on him. He started to suffer from insomnia. Every evening when he gets back from a long, fretful day at the office, he stays up into the early hours of the morning playing video games to wind down it's not like the normally laid back Ray Allison thinks to be so uptight. Um, I want to point out about sleep deprivation. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a doctor or psychologist, but sleep deprivation can do some weird things to the mind, especially a person who's already got issues. Um, it can catapult them uh, further into some kind of, some kind of psychosis and stuff like that. Um, I remember a time I would work for like 72 hours straight at the hospital. <laughs> I got in my car and I heard great music. I mean, I love this song. Only the radio radio wasn't on, <laughs> you know, I'm like, and it's weird because this is a song I hadn't heard for years and I, I heard it perfectly and I heard all the words and I didn't even know those stupid words. I'm like, wow, I need sleep. I need sleep. Um, and so he was having, he was suffering from anxiety, sleep deprivation and some kind of Something was going on. Now she says this too. She admits that uh, right, right at the time before his death, the Freemasons had become a subject of fascination for Ray. She recalls that he spent a weekend before his disappearance reading Joseph Fort Newton's 1914 book, The Builders, which connects the origins of Freemasonry to ancient Egypt and the early mystery religions. Earlier on the afternoon, he went missing. Rivera purchased right on the right on the afternoon he went missing. Purchased a book called Freemasons for Dummies and kept an appointment with a member of a uh, Maryland Masonic Lodge to discuss the possibility of joining the Masons. This gentleman said there was nothing unusual about the conversation at all, describing as typical someone who wanted to learn about the organization's membership. Ray thanked him for the meeting and said he would be in touch. 
Now, you can become a Mason and have a perfectly normal life. All right. There's a lot of arguments over what Masonic temples are like. You know, many people say, hey, it's just, you know, it's a it's a it's a community thing. It's a it's a it's a building tool for, you know, helping out the community and and getting people together, businessmen and so on and so forth. Um and then there's those who claim every Masonic temple is part of some kind of massive cult going back in, in you know hundreds of years. And apparently Ray Rivera was going down that route. And it is fascinating. And I, you know, I'm sure I'm going to get those comments below that so many things have happened in the world. People will claim all kinds of bizarre rituals and rites have connected to the Mace, uh, Masonic temples and and every time I've seen somebody going off the rails, the Masonic thing is in there. It's either a satanic thing or it's a Masonic thing. Uh, it's, it's, there's something weird. It's a metaphysical thing. It's like when, when you start questioning the world you live in and you start saying that there may be all kinds of things at play that you don't understand or we do understand, but if you just have to read the right things to find out what they really are, and then you start connecting those dots, even if the dots are being connected like, like this, they're connecting in ways that you believe make sense, which is a concern. Um, because nothing wrong with, with, with studying. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I've written a book about Cleopatra. I spent time in the py Great Pyramid. Um, I've traveled in a lot of cultures and I understand they're different, you know, they have different spirituality in these different kinds of cultures. Uh, certainly, if I, you know, when I'm in India, uh, Hinduism is very, very different from Christianity. Um, and, and so, you know, I see the whole differences between the two ways of thinking. And, and, and there's all kinds of different variations in, just across the world, massive amounts of variations. But, when, but it's interesting, people seem to have a similar road they go down when they start essentially losing it. So... She said he doesn't have any problems, but then again, maybe he was. So right after they started doing the investigation, they found this taped behind his computer. This is a piece of paper that was a, it was a printout that was also shrunk down uh, to very small letters and then taped behind his computer. Now, let me tell you something. People don't usually tape things behind the computer, except it, they're hiding it, but who are they hiding it from? Are they hiding it from their wife because it's uh, all the phone numbers of the girlfriends or are they hiding something else from, from somebody that might get hold of their important things or are they hiding something they don't want people to know they're thinking about. Anyway, they found this behind the computer and this was the, this was the piece of paper and they don't show uh, uh, on the show. They don't show too much of it. Um, uh, so at any rate, um, uh, let me read you what it said. And this part, as soon as this showed up in the show and I started reading part of it, I was convinced about where we were at. Listen to what he says. Brothers and sisters, right now around the world, volcanoes are erupting. What an awesome sight. Virtue and by the way, there's some questionable things. Some things are blurred. So this is close. This, this guy could get writing this. Virtue and mores. I'm not sure if that's what it is. Uh, Non-separables. Whom virtue unites, death will not separate. Whom virtue unites, death will not separate. That's a Masonic thing. That was a well-played game. Congratulations to all who participated. I hope you enjoyed it. But it's time to wake up. So here I am. I'd like to welcome those who accepted our invitations for membership during the game. We couldn't have done it without you. I took on the endeavor to find the truth, but for its own sake, it's accepting this quest for the truth. I hope to awake myself with the help of others and to a man ready and worthy to receive it. Members of the council, please note, I will lend peaceful concentration to the traditional responsibilities in light of the proceedings. And I will sadly or gladly, uh, the standard request of this council and again, well done to all those participated. I accept the council has invited the players who give their lives to the pursuit back so they may be able to join us, including as Stanley Kubrick and other peoples. Uh, and it goes on and on with all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, then he goes on to name all kinds of just different things, human genome, genetic engineering, um, internet, ethernet, 
all kinds of weird stuff. And then he's got, then he goes into, uh, my primary residence, which includes a beautiful piece of property in Northern Argentina. You know, she didn't have, have, um, uh, and then he mentions books that have contributed to this books and movies, the matrix, uh, family man, which is a, which is a go back in time, uh, redo your life type of thing. He also said people would be five years less in, in age, like they were, you know, you could take five years off their age and all of a sudden. Um, then he talks about a, 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 thing, a, a whole bunch of things, Fight Club, Seven, Lord of the Rings. Uh, some of these are perfectly normal movies. Um, but he also talks about a, a movie called The Game. And in The Game, this has got a, 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 a shoot, no, I'm going to blank. <laughs> Hold on a second. I've got to pull them up. It's some um, mm -mm. uh, famous actor. <laughs> the game. Not the game plan. Actor. Okay. It's a Michael. That's not the one. Not the TV series. Where the heck is the movie? Uh, I'm sorry. Who's in the movie? Does anybody, has anybody seen this one? Um, it looks stupid. Uh, it's got... um. Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas is in it. Sean Penn is in it. It's a it, it's this movie about how this guy's got you know this, this snotty life of you know businessman and doesn't appreciate anything. So they play this whole game on him where they pretend everybody's after him, and um, and so he ends up on a rooftop like this, and he's looking over the rooftop and he ends up jumping, and then he crashes through the ceiling, the roof, and then through the ceiling of this very fancy place. And he, now he's falling. He's, he's continuing to fall, fall, fall. He's, I mean, he's, got, he's jumped off a massive building just like the Belvedere. And then he lands, but he lands in in this protective, uh, you know, like, you know, they had it set up so that when he fell through, he wouldn't wouldn't die. And so there he is, and he's, he's survived, and they take him off, and he's like, he's now realized that he's survived the game, and he's now a new man because he's learned something. No, I think personally, I think it's a stupid ass movie, but that's my opinion. <laughs> because speaking of physics, none of them work in this movie. It's ridiculous. Um, but anyway, people love it. Um, he watched it. And I'm I'm reading that the minute I read this note, I said to myself, he's psychotic. Is he suffering some kind of psycho psychosis? And that suppose his wife even said he wrote that the day he she could see that scraps or something in the trash can. He wrote it the day he vanished. And I know, psych I know psychotic writing when I see it. There's a difference. And people will say this, and I want to point this out. He's, he's a writer. He's a writer. He has a wild imagination. He writes lots of notes in different places. I'm a writer too. I don't write stuff that's psychotic. Okay? I don't. Psychotic stuff is stuff that a good writer will make sense. Even if you're writing a sci-fi thing, you're still going to write in, in, in proper sentences. Or if you're going to write a, a, um, an outline, you're going to write an outline that, that makes sense. But I, again, I want, I want to uh, read to you. This is one, this is, this is the person who keeps writing me. I, I've had 200 emails from her already because she, she clearly has schizophrenia, but let me just read you a couple paragraphs again. So you can see what he's saying is nonsensical and what she's saying is nonsensical. And I suspect the Siemens group has put a, Another Shepherd Pratt tween on me today. Now, Pat, this is where I get ugly. What I did for Roger and others far vastly overshoot. That sad day I left and came back. Well, I considered Sue a friendly ghost, a great read, and in short, dark years, just a playful analytical challenge to me. That's all in that I knew by 16 I was far above others mentally. At 16, I knew I was so bright. I would frighten other teens, but I was an analyst like me, like Pat, me and John Douglas. Um, and then she goes on, you know, so hot dogs on the grill, camping tunes, donuts and coffee in the AM before Pilates stretching. And then let's look again at the third day scenario that lost Johnny. She's talking about the little uh, Johnny gosh that went missing. You see what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's nonsensical stuff. She does a lot of religious stuff in there, a lot of spiritual things. And she's all over the map. And so is he. And I read this. And the first thing I said to myself is, the guy's psychotic. The minute this showed up in the movie. And so I put in, I literally put in uh, Ray Rivera, schizophrenia. 
And I came up with what Benny was talking about, which was the prosecutor's, uh, the prosecutor's podcast files. I'm going to link that because they have great information here. All right. It says right here, fact sheet on the death of Ray Rivera. There was clear evidence that Ray Rivera had suffered a psychotic break. Ray Rivera left a note in his home before his death. The FBI's behavioral analysis unit prepared a report on the note in which the FBI psychiatrist concluded that, quote, the writer of the letter likely suffers from persecutory delusional disorder. And the writing in this letter is also consistent with someone who suffers from a bipolar disorder. I'm not sure I entirely agree with all their, their diagnoses, um, but I get the main point. This assumption is based on the flight of ideas that would have been written by someone experiencing an untreated manic episode, also called words, word, word salad, um, where psychopaths write to me and they're clear as a bell. They may be lying, <laughs> fabricating, manipulating, but they're clear as a bell. Psychotics are not clear. Our person going through psychosis is not clear. And when I used to interpret uh, for the hospitals, uh, as a sign language interpreter, and one of my patients would, she'd start signing. And the doctor would say, what is she saying? And I'm like, I have no clue. I kept, because I'm supposed to put, they're supposed to, uh, a person will sign, a deaf person will sign a thought. And then it will interpret what they, the th whole thought is. But our thoughts are so jumbled. I'm like, I don't know. Refrigerator running, bad, bad man. I don't know what she's talking about. She's psychotic at the moment, and so I can't even interpret. So this is what they're saying here. The writing in the letter is disorganized and to a lesser extent is consistent with someone who suffers from schizophrenia. I was like, and I said, I was, I was like watching this movie. As soon as I saw the note, I stopped the movie and went right straight to Ray Rivera schizophrenia. That's how quickly I saw it. Um, the FBI also explained in this particular case, the mental illness suffered by the author of the letter may go virtually undetected by family, friends, and coworkers. And he may have been going downhill. Mind you, he was no longer working full time for the company. He was now doing independent work. And I believe there's an awful lot of people out there who do not recognize those kind of symptoms in their loved ones. Sometimes they can cover it up, but a lot of times they just think, oh, they're just um, artistic. Not autistic, but artist artistic. They're writers. They, they're thinking all the time and crazy stuff. Uh, this you know, stream of consciousness. Well, I can do stream of consciousness too, but it's, I, I do it here right on, <laughs> I do it right here on the channel. <laughs> but I hope that my stream of consciousness is still fluid and comprehensible and not a whole bunch of nonsense that you go, what the hell is she even talking about? It still has things in proper order. It still has a, flu a fluent thought. When you lose that, your stream of consciousness goes all over the place. Then there's something wrong in the, in the firing of whatever's going on in the, uh, it's going on in the brain. Now, it says here, although certain sections of the report are redacted, it is clear that the FBI concluded that Ray Rivera committed suicide because of a psychotic disorder. Now, I'm going to get to the whole concept of, yes, did he commit suicide? All right. But apparently they did not think he was murdered. All right. Now, another thing they say, which is interesting, is that Ray Rivera had previously been to the roof of the Belvedere, Belvedere Hotel to watch a sunset and on the day of his disappearance had visited a website showing when the sun would set in Baltimore that day. So it wasn't like he was unfamiliar with the Belvedere. He knew the Belvedere and he'd been there. So, and he'd been there with his wife as well. So he, he was comfortable there and he probably knew things, maybe how you could get to the roof and all this kind of thing. Now, also, um, it says, according to the Brotman book, which is a good book, in 2006, when Rivera found his way to the roof, the elevator was often left unlocked. Many of the fire doors were not alarmed. The security cameras didn't always work. People always say, oh, my God, it must have been a whole setup because the security camera wasn't working. Well, half the time, these things don't work, especially back in 2006. Um, and the bartenders on that 13th floor would often go to the roof to smoke. So the roof access doors usually left unlocked. So there was access to these things. And none of these facts, and here is where I love what they say here. Thank you, Prosecutor Podcast. Uh, again, we'll link this, link to that. You might want to go over there and, and listen to what they have to say. None of these facts are addressed in the Unsolved Mysteries episode. How about that? In fact, the episode conveys the roof was essentially inaccessible. They want to keep you believing that he couldn't have gotten there on his own. 
Um, and what was also interesting is that the author of that book that I like concluded, uh, she thought he, he, took, he committed, you know, took his own life after a psychotic break. Now, listen to this. Um, she said, I was surprised when they told me they wouldn't be using any of the footage in the final show. She filmed, let's see, how, wait a minute, where is this here? Um, according to the uh, Reddit thread, uh, uh, Unsolved Mysteries learned about the case through her book, contacted her over a year before the episode was broadcast, interviewed her for approximately three hours, and filmed much of the segment in her apartment in the Belvedere Hotel. Ultimately, Unsolved Murders cut all of Nikita Brockman's interview footage from the final episode. She said, I was surprised when they told me they wouldn't be using any of the footage in the final show. But when I saw it, it made sense to me. The shows are scripted and they all follow the same kind of plot trajectory. I think if they included my interviews, it would have closed down a lot of speculation because it would have been obvious that a lot of avenues and angles had, had already been explored at length. And what I said didn't fit the whole agenda that they were seeking, which is why a lot of times I won't do these kind of shows anymore. And, and just recently, I'm going to do a, sh a short uh, thing on this. Uh, 2020 just came out with a show called um, Confession, question mark, on the Anderson Cotta case. Uh, and I, I've done a show on the whole Anderson Cotta case, which I was involved in. And they call, they contacted me to be in the show. And I asked them, are you going to talk about my work in, in, in uh, investigate my, con my profiling work in this case that I, I, that I determined who committed the crime and all this stuff and all the things that I came up with. And they wouldn't answer that question. And they said, we want, you know, we want you to come on. I said, well, you're going to pay me. And they said, no. So I'm like, so what you're going to do is you're going to sit me down for that three hour interview. And you're going to get me to talk about my work in the case and all that. And in the end, you're going to put up Pat Brown says, no, he says, he, I think he's a psychopath. And I'm going to get some shitty little pieces in the film. They're not going to pay me for it. And they're not going to actually put in what I want. So I sent, I said, I won't do it, but I will do it for no money. If you allow me to put in this exact statement and they refused and I didn't show up in the show at all. I was vanished out of there, even though I was an integral part at certain points in the entire case, but I vanished. She vanished too. <laughs> That's the way they work. So when you watch these, um, these documentaries, you have to be very careful to understand a lot of times you're not exactly getting the truth. Now, one more thing the prosecutors guys came up with, which I really thought was fascinating too. A phone call. Remember that phone call supposedly came from his boss or his boss's offices? The phone call Ray Rivera received before leaving his house for the last time was not from Stansbury and Associates. Contrary to Allison Rivera's claim on Unsolved Mysteries, the last call that Ray received just before he left his home was from the Fells Point neighborhood of Baltimore not from a switchboard at Stansbury and Associates. So that's not even true either. So the, the phone call didn't come from the business. And so his boss had nothing to do with anything, but the show keeps pushing that this whole thing is, you know, there's this whole big, and, 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 and this, that, that one, one uh, detective, this good, this guy, uh, where's my detective guy here? Uh, where is he? Um, uh, where is I want to put his picture up here again. Here he is. This guy, the one detective in the police department who said, oh, it's a homicide. He has been pushing this and pushing this and pushing this. And I think he's been uh, coming up with a lot of information that isn't exactly so. And he's on the show and he's like the hero of the show trying to still prove this is a homicide and, and so on and so forth. The entire rest of the Baltimore Police Department said it's a suicide. Now, do I believe it's a suicide? Let me, let me do that and then I'll go to your questions. Do I believe it's a suicide? All right. Now, let's take a look at last thing that she said, which I really, hold on a second. Okay, we talked about how he could fall off the roof. Okay. All right, let's go to, hold on a second. All right, that's not it. I'm trying to find the last, okay. So, I've read you the information. Okay. And she says, after reading the note as well, typically the note features uh, uh, the typical writing of a schizophrenic person. Then she says, uh, almost everyone who knows the facts about Ray Rivera's death comes to the assumption that it's just a suicide. They cannot seem to get beyond what they regard as two pieces of unshakable evidence, the cryptic le letter and the running jump. I agree. The letter is cryptic and the, he had to have a running jump to go off that uh, 
that roof and there's really no other way he would have crashed through. So I believe there's no one else involved that he did indeed do the running jump. And, but I, the, uh, it's the only thing I want this thing I disagree with. She says here in the logic of Sherlock Holmes, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable must be the truth. I believe I have covered every event eventuality I've eliminated. I have eliminated suicide, murder, and accident. Well, now you think what the hell's left? <laughs> What remains is, I think, the only plausible answer to the puzzle. Okay, and she says, um, oh, she says that Ray was experiencing an episode of psychosis. All right, now, what do I agree on? All right, I want to point out a couple things. All right, one of the things I want to point out is this. Uh, Occam's razor is, is when you hear hoofbeats, hoof beats, what is it? When you hear hoofbeats, generally speaking, if you're in America, it's a horse, right? That's usually the correct answer. Doesn't You don't have to go down some big rabbit hole. You don't have to go about, you don't have to connect 700 dots. It's usually a horse. Unless, if you live in Africa, it might be a zebra. If you live in Tanzania or Kenya, or if you live in Maryland at the time where the zebras from a, somebody who had them on a farm, just uh, 50, I think I'm 10 minutes down the road from me, they, their zebras did get loose. <laughs> so the, so my daughter, who was in the was is with the with the, with the police department. She was running around looking for those zebras. So yeah, on occasion it's true the hoofbeats are zebras even in Maryland. But this is the point: ninety nine percent of the time when you hear hoofbeats in the U.S. the U.S. it's going to be if they're running around near you, it's horse. So you can consider it could be a zebra, but you have to not just jump down that whole thing as if if this would be absolutely true. Um, the problem with rabbit holes is that they're rabbit holes. Okay. And they're, they're, they're taking so many pieces of information and they're misconstruing them. And that's, that's the problem with them. Well, Occam's razor makes more sense. Now, therefore I'm going to go with Occam's razor in this. I think it was not suicide. I agree with her. I think it was a result of a psychotic moment. I don't know that he was trying to kill himself. I go with more of an accident due to psychosis in the sense that I don't, I don't know that he knew he was going to die. I don't know if he didn't think he was playing that game and he was going to run and leap into the night and somehow he's going to go into some other dimension. And when you believe that it's not suicide because you actually aren't trying to kill yourself. You're, you think something else is going to happen. Now, now, mind you, he might have been frustrated with his life. He was a failed sc a screenwriter. I mean, he wanted to be a screenwriter. He had never succeeded in selling anything that became any kind of a movie. He's, you know, he's sitting he's in his 30s. You start getting frustrated. It's not It's like being a writer and no one ever publishes your darn book. You can call yourself a writer, but you're not actually selling. And people aren't reading your stuff. You're not seeing it come to fruition. And that's frustrating. So he didn't really love his job that he had. He wasn't into financial writing. And he was, it wasn't succeeding in those other things. At some point, did he start thinking There's, there must be more to life? And he started going down this schizophrenic thinking uh, and psychotic thinking, which it clearly to me he did. And at that moment in time, he convinced himself through the miswiring in his brain through that something, something else could happen. And he, he listened to whatever voice or whatever concept came to him and he went to explore it. And at that moment in time, he thought it was something he should do. So I don't necessarily think he committed suicide. I don't think he didn't love his wife. I don't think that he hate, he really wanted to die necessarily. He may have thought he could fly or at least get to another dimension. I have no idea because you know what? Somebody's in that level of psychotic state. Then their grip on reality is, is, is not there. Um, and they don't really know what is, what can't, what what the results are going to be of a certain action. They don't have that concept there. Um, I don't see anything. In, I don't see anything in his life necessarily. I could, I can believe he was depressed. I believe that in the last two weeks before his uh, this happened, he seemed to be very paranoid. He seemed to be going off the rails. He seemed to be exploring into realms that maybe he shouldn't have explored into. That just bolstered his screwed up thinking at that point. So yeah, I think he went, I think he ran, I think he leaped. 
and he didn't make the other dimension. Or maybe he is in the other dimension. You know, hey, you know what I mean? Just because his body's here doesn't mean his spirit isn't in another dimension. Maybe he succeeded. Maybe he succeeded in exactly what he wanted to do. So for myself, I call this an accident caused by psychosis. That's what I would go with. Because I don't think there's a, an intent to commit suicide. I don't see. I would say an accident caused by a, psych a psychotic moment of his life. Um, and I think there's zero, and no one else is involved in any way, shape or form. And even if you cannot understand the physics of how he went off the building, there's no other explanation that makes any sense. So that's Occam's razor. razor. You do, no, he didn't get chucked out of a helicopter. No, nobody hit him with a car and didn't do any other damage. He didn't get the car damaged or hit the wall or anything. And he flew over there. No, nobody hit him with a car and then carried his body over there and staged this whole thing. None of this makes any sense. He couldn't have even been thrown off the building because he'd have to have the running thing. And so throw, he would have fallen off the building. It would have been, wouldn't have catapulted any, that kind of velocity behind him to go where he did. He went through the hole in the roof. He went through at a high rate of speed. He went off a roof. And the reason he went off the roof is one can say, some might think it's suicide. I think it's accident by a psychotic moment in his life. Um, and I see no other evidence, any other direction. I think sadly that documentary is one of those documentaries I don't respect because their, their only issue was to make it more of a mystery. And I think that's cruel to the family. And I think it's, it's, it's misinformation to everybody watching. It is not a proper analysis, but they're making money off of it and they don't care. And that's, I find it unethical. That's why I have problems with so many of the documentary makers. Some do a great job, but so many times what they put out there is really questionable. So um, you have to be very careful when you read these things and the same thing is true for books people want to make money off of books they'll go on they'll go down some really big rabbit holes so they can sell books because as somebody pointed out you know as this woman pointed out hey if we just did did the truth it probably would have been a 20 a 30 minute show and they 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 wanted more than that um if you write a book that says hey this is what happened you can't pull it any further like this is my one show on the case. I'm not going to have 50 videos talking about everything else that could have happened to Ray Rivera and every other theory in the world because there aren't any other theories. This is it. This is what you're going to get. Won't make, make me as much money as 50 videos, <laughs> but it'll be the truth. Um, so now I'm going to go to your um, comments. And again, if you're new to the channel and this is the end of my commentary on this and I'm going to answer questions, please do like and subscribe and go get your free books. If, so anyway, let me see. Whew. All right. Let's see. Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> the fugitive zebras. I was so mad I never saw them. It was crazy. I mean, we were almost going to get one of those zebras because, you know, we already have a horse, a donkey, three llamas, two alpacas, and a goat and chickens. Why shouldn't we have a, why shouldn't we have a zebra? You know, we tried to get one, but we didn't get it. Um, so, <laughs> oh, I'm glad you agree with me. Hey, at least one person. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Stephanie says, as my husband points out, in the rare case, it is zebras. You will have to likely, oh, if, okay, wait a minute. As my husband points out, in the rare case, it is zebras. You will likely have other evidence pointing to zebras, like a news report about zebras on the loose. Yes, this is so. So it's not like you have this other possibility that's a really rare possibility, but not one shred of evidence even, even begins to point in that direction. And that's the problem with rabbit holes that people go down because they really don't have evidence. They make up evidence. They claim things are evidence that are not, but it's not so. And so, yeah, I mean, there are the, there are those cases where you're like, wow, that is very unique and very rare. Um, like, but you, there are these things that, like you say, droppings <laughs> that weren't horses uh, weren't horses um let's see um lila says pat this documentary doctoring is really sad people unquestionably believe these documentaries made by household name channels they do because they believe that the documentary is trying to get at the truth and that's not the truth and that's what's sickening about it all because you know, it's all about, you know, where they think the money is coming in. And 
And I've seen some, I, I've seen some fabulous documentaries. Mind you, it's not all documentary makers. Some are really good. And the murder of Cleo, the mysterious death of Cleopatra, my documentary was great. <laughs> I say so myself, but I've been in documentaries where I wanted to sue them after I was in, because I was so appalled. And that's why I do very, very rarely do I do them because I don't trust them unless I get something written. And I say, Hey, you're not, you're not going to misconstrue. You're not going to edit. You're not going to leave out. You're not going to have me say something and then come out with a whole different agenda, which basically says everything I said is wrong. And now we got these people to prove it. And it's all lies. I mean, it's sad, but you got to be very careful about what's behind it. And so you, that's why you have, you have to do a lot of research and uh, to find out what the actual facts are. It's, it's horrifying. Um, it really is. It's sad. And it's not fair. It's not fair to the families either. Although sometimes the families want to continue those, you know, whatever belief they have. So, yeah. Um, let's say, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> Stephanie makes a good point. I mean, the title of the show is Unsolved Mysteries. They don't have much motivation to make these case less, cases less mysterious, let alone solve them. Touche on that one. That's true. I mean, but you know, if you're going to do unsolved mysteries, you ought to pick mysteries that actually are unsolved. I mean, there are, there are excellent ones that are unsolved that are, you know, you're just like, I don't know what happened, you know? Um, uh, for example, the one I, the one I just did on uh, Tiffany um, in, Flor in Florida, that is an unsolved mystery. I have the uh, possible theories. I, I have ideas of what, things could mean and how things could work, but I, I, it's still unsolved in my opinion. I don't have an answer for it. I mean, as, even as a profiler, I can, I, I'm, I'm telling I'm showing you how I would investigate it, how I would analyze it, but I'm still like, I can't prove anything because it is still unsolved. So yes, there are those that are truly unsolved mysteries. Do those, don't do the ones that are quite frankly solved. Um, yeah. Uh, the, no, there were no drugs and no drugs. Uh, they found a little, they, they, theoretical alcohol, but that could be from composition, uh, decomposition, but no, no, he was not taking any drugs. That is correct. Um, um, Lila says, wow, that writing is seriously disjointed, not creative or stream of consciousness. It speaks to a serious, serious mental problems, like a psychotic break. Yeah. I mean, there's a difference between taking notes, um, which can be little, you know, ideas and stuff like that. But I mean, as a writer, I do sort of recognize and there's a difference between somebody coming up with some clever ideas for writing and what their crap doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> and it's just not right. And, and you can, you can see it immediately. I mean, it's like, Whoa, that's the, and also when people do strange things with writing, uh, when, when, when a psychotic, a person who's schizophrenic or psychotic at that time, like sends a letter, their writing is all over the place. Sometimes they scroll down every single margin and then they write on the back of the envelope too. I mean, it's like they can't stop themselves. So it's, and he took this, he wrote these things and then he, then he reduced them in this tiny little note. It's so something is always off. Um, that make any sense. Um, uh, let's see. Let me, let me go back up here a second. Um, uh, <laughs> there you go. Sandra says, my son-in-law is a Mason. And he rolled his eyes at the documentary. You know, yeah, I mean, Masons across the world are going, <sighs> you know, <laughs> we're not all part of some weird cult that's taking over the world or is whatever the, <laughs> whatever the things are. Um, oh, well, that, that's true. Uh, Stephanie says, I don't think anyone jumping off that roof would think there was a possibility of survival unless they were delusional. Well, yeah. I mean, that's why most people say suicide. They wanted to die. But since he was delusional at the time, in my opinion, it's hard to say what he thought would happen. And maybe he did think he would shed his human body and be released into the spiritual body. I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I, I personally hope that, you know, when I die, that is exactly what happens. I hope I shed my physical body and my spiritual self takes off. So I theoretically, even then I could say, if I jumped off the roof of a building, I'm just, it'd be no different than dying from natural causes because my body would go and then I, my spirit would take off. That's kind of rational, you know, um, but what propelled him to do this is concerning. He's a young man. He's in good health. 
His wife loves him. His family seems to be great. I mean, he may not be succeeding in his field. I mean, I know that's frustrating, especially when you're hitting 30s. And he's only young, 32. He's not like even hitting mid middle age, really. But I understand it's frustrating. Um, your dream is not happening. And maybe he just feels like he, no matter what he does, he can't get any further. And he's got to live a life of drudgery. And I don't mean his wife. I mean, the, the work he just I don't think he really liked the work he was doing at all. And I can't blame him. <laughs> I wouldn't have liked it either. You know, but it does pay the bills. And he was making good money. He just hated the job. Uh, you know, um, I'd go with this. Huh? Let's see. Oh, hold on a second. I'm going to go back up here a second. Um, uh, nobody noticed all the noise creating the hole. Uh, well, if, if, he, if he fell through it, of course, it would be very instantaneous. Uh, and my, my one memory, I, I just always remember this because it just... It struck me. I was in Philadelphia. I was working on the, the Anderson Cotta case. Actually, I was up there checking out pawn shops and um, I heard a gunshot. But, you know, the duration of the sound of a gunshot is extraordinarily limited. So I heard it and then I couldn't remember it because it was already gone. And then I thought to myself, did I hear a gunshot? And then you start saying, nah, probably was a backfire or maybe I never even heard it. So if you fell through the, the impact, would have been a momentary sound that people might not have recognized or knew quite how to define it. So they just go, okay. Now somebody creating them to creating the, uh, if somebody is creating the hole for the purposes of staging, well, first of all, they have to get on the, they have to get up there. <laughs> That's the first thing they have to do. And how did they get there? Did they jump off the roof? <laughs> you know, how did they end up there? Did they crawl down? I mean, they bring a ladder to get that spot. Then how did they hack through that hole to make it look like a guy had gone through? I mean, you know, let's say the whole thing is ridiculous. There's just no way that, um, yeah, yeah it, it, it doesn't work. Um, okay. Is that, at least I said, met a guy in a hotel and for a chat, got violent, tried to escape by going to the edge and onto the roof and then thought his best chance of escape was jumping. Well, there are some people who they, they, they go down the theory that they, 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 there was a homosexual encounter that, you know, nobody ever knew he was gay. But, you know, hey, you know, might have been on the down low, um, could have gone to meet somebody uh, and then things went wrong. In theory, that's how he could have gotten in one of those condos and jumped out the window and got onto that ledge. Possible. And he was trying to escape. But here's the problem. That morning, he wrote that note, and that note is psychotic. And so this is the problem. We, we take something that seems, he's in this whole, he's on this downhill slope of having paranoia and other things. Then he writes this psychotic note, and then he jumps off a roof. I mean, you could say that it was coincidental that he was actually, uh, you know, actually he was beating somebody, and, and it was a bad encounter. And he ran from it, and it was an accidental death because he was trying to escape. Or somebody could say the guy was chasing him and gave him a big fat shove and it was homicide. But see, these, these are speculations that really don't have a lot of support because there's no proof that that makes any, that ever happened. And the trajectory of his life at that point was uh, the way it was. So um, um, there was some blood and I can't, I can't get Molly. I, I couldn't find the good information on this. So I, um, no mention of blood except some in the conference room on the walls. There's claims that there was too little blood for the for the damage that was done to him. And so I guess they're trying to say he was like something would happen to him elsewhere. So the blood is elsewhere and then he was carried in. That's where that theory comes from. I don't know how much blood there was. And I don't know how much blood there would actually be. Uh, and one of the things you learn, because uh, I, I, I have one case. I'm going to have to do that case one day. The guy went out a window um, and he fell he hit, he, he went straight down and he hit, um, I think a, a, an air conditioner on the way down. Oh, and, and, and then he ended up in this, like in this, um, what, what do you call those? Uh, it's kind of like, it's not a, a shoot or anything. It's between the, 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 the apartment buildings. It's just a, like a little area. And the family believed he was beaten and placed there. 
And when I examined the case, I'm like, no, he went out the window because you could see the damage to his body was from whacking on things and the air conditioner going down. Um, but bodies do weird things. Um, and it only takes you know, such strange things that can happen. Um, just the way you hit, just the way. I mean, you could, you could throw, you could throw different, you know, like some kind of dummies down in different ways. And you could, you'd be surprised at how many times that certain things can happen. When you think about the fact that sometimes people, the parachute didn't open and they actually landed and didn't die. <laughs> it seems impossible, but it happens because that one time that person landed in such a way that he didn't die. And that happens. Uh, other times people can fall from you know, one story, it's one story and break their neck. You know, it's like people walk away from car accidents, horrifying car accidents. One person is completely mangled. And the other person just gets up and walks away. Why? It's just a lot of, the physics are there, but if you, you'd have to see everything in slow motion to see exactly what the body did, how it, how it hit certain things, what was the material it hit, and what did that material do to damage or to slow down or to, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And it's unfortunate we don't have the video, you know? So, yeah, no, no helicopter was known going over. Again, that's just so silly. The last place you would dump the body is right there where people can find it. You, I mean, we're right next to the water. Believe you me, that body's going in the water. If he's going out of a, 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 a helicopter. <laughs> um, because, first of all, I don't know that there's, as far as the caller goes, um, here's what happens. Uh, I, I, who knows? Who knows what the call was um, or who it was? And it is, it is, they never, they didn't ever find out who, where the phone call came from. Um, don't know. And don't know why he had the reaction. Um, don't know whether it was, a, could have been, a, could have been a, a wrong call and he, he, he's paranoid. So he heard something differently. It could be some, minimal thing that or maybe somebody did meet him maybe he went to meet somebody because they somebody they saw, thought they saw him in another location maybe he did meet somebody and then that per, then he left and went to the belvedere and killed himself then uh, you know um and and you and not everybody will admit when they're the last person to call somebody on a telephone they may be totally unwilling to admit it because they're scared they're scared that they're going to end up being accused of something and they're not wrong. They're not wrong at all. That is often what happens. So if they, if nobody knows it was them, <laughs> they're like, and I'm not saying anything either. So, um, let's say, uh, uh, that's it. Da, da, da. Hold on a second. Let's see. Uh, Midge, Midge says, when I heard that bit about the secret note tape behind the, the computer, uh, I thought paranoid and unraveling. Yeah, that's a, that is just a weird thing. You know, there are some things that are kind of the big red flags for certain, certain kinds of behaviors. And if you work in a field long enough, you recognize those behaviors. You've seen them before, you see them again. And that's why when I've said so, something like, oh, that person's lying or the person's being, you know, they're, they're, they're a grifter or a fraud. And people go, why would you say that? Because I've seen it before. And you know, it doesn't mean that I think everybody who has similar behavior is always that, but I've seen enough of it to be able to differentiate between this group and that small group that isn't doing it. Um, and could I be wrong? Yes, but I've seen a lot of it. So, and therefore, um, no, no, so, yeah, that's a, that was a kind of a big red flag for me right there. Um, oh, that's a good point, too. Grandiose stuff, this hidden message. Yeah. Um, that, one of the things about grandiosity, it's not always about yourself, but it's about you want to be part of, of a grand vision or a, grand, a grander world than we live in now. Um, you want to be part of some huge, unknown or hidden a uh, secret world um, that somehow someone gives you more meaning. 
And that's what it comes down to. You want more meaning than might be a very mundane world that you live in, um, especially when you're failing in it and in a way that you think you're failing in it. Maybe nobody else does, as you might think that. Um, um, oh, that's also possible. Like talking to someone who isn't there. Yeah. And maybe the phone call was, I say, maybe, you know, and, 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 and the roommate of the person who was staying there said she, she, I think she said she heard the phone ring and then he, he seemed to make an exclamation and run off. And I, again, I, did she hear the phone ring would be another question. Did she just think he answered the phone? You could be talking to nobody and run off or somebody he thinks was there and run off. So I'm not even sure. I can't see, you know, but they said they had, wait, wait, take that back. They did say the phone call came from, not from Agora, but from the Fells Point district. So no, the phone call did come in. I take that back. That did come in. Um, so she did hear the phone call. Yeah. Okay. She did hear the phone call. He did answer a phone and then he left, but I don't know. It's hard to say why, what, who, who was on the, they, I wish they had figured out who that was, who, who made the phone call, but I, certainly don't think that that person a person didn't push him off the building that's the whole point so even if you went to talk to somebody he still that running leap is the problem right there because it isn't that he just was it wasn't pushed off the building see if he had fallen right straight down and pushed off the building i would say yeah he could have been pushed um but that had to be a running leap. And that's that's the key. That's why the Baltimore police came quickly and said it's not a homicide, that it was a suicide. Although I think it might have been more of an accidental death. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> Benny loves Shutter Island. <laughs> I have, you know, I watched it a long time ago. Now I have to watch it again because you keep telling me how much your favorite movie and I got to find out whether I like it anymore. I don't remember if I liked it the first time, but I'll have to watch it again. Um, um, and that's a good point, Walter Matilda. There were recent stresses for Ray. House alarm is going off on two separate occasions, which could have triggered a psychotic break. Now, normally that wouldn't. But he got very paranoid and his wife also, because there were these two alarms that went off, think somebody was there and was trying to get into the house. There's no evidence there was any attempted break in or anybody was doing anything to him. But the, but the conspiracy theory goes on and the rabbit hole theories go on that, yes, he was paranoid for a reason. I say, you know, they say that, you know, you're you're not paranoid if everybody's really after you, you know, <laughs> or maybe you're paranoid, but it's because everybody's after you. So you can have a you can have a legitimate reason to be paranoid if if you're in danger um but there was no proof that there was ever anything that the police thought it was a squirrel set the things off um but he was very paranoid and then it made his wife paranoid so now she thinks somebody else was definitely out to get to get um to get him um let's say uh I'll go down more here. Let's see. Um, oh, this is true. Stephanie says, I think in these situations, relatives and loved ones are ashamed. They didn't see the signs, are convinced they would have. And since they didn't, they conclude the signs weren't there. That is correct. Um, and, you know, unless a person is like 100% schizophrenic 24 hours a day, and there's just more ups and downs, they can hide more of those. Um, and they can also, again, if you're artistic, you can hide a lot of things behind being an art, artsy person or a writer. Uh, when she found, he has, a, he had a lot of writings that were all over the place that were weird. And she goes, well, that's, he just writes all the time. And that's, that's for his ideas, for his shows. I saw a few more of those and I wasn't too convinced. <laughs> I think they're more of that issue. Um, he had, he had, he was definitely mentally uh, not stable at that point. Um. Let's see. Uh, well, again, de denial. Yes, Alexandria. There's a lot. Of, I think there's a lot of denial there. And um, once you admit that, the game is over for her too. You know, he he had his own game, and it's over. But now, she just admits, yeah, he was acting really weird, and he probably jumped off the dang building. You lose. You lose. Um, that's it. It's the end. Nobody needs to find out anything anymore. You don't, you don't have this whole 
group of people behind you, you don't have unsolved mysteries showing up in your doorstep to do a show. Um, so you can keep things going and, and sometimes it keeps the memory of them going too, where once, once you just accept the memory, it stops there. But if the, if you don't accept, then he stays alive in your mind as far as trying to figure out what happened to him. So there's a whole psychological thing there. Um, uh, let's see. Um, supposedly there was not schizophrenia in the family. Not that I heard of. So, yeah, I, 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 a very good agenda, a very good word for these fact-based and documentaries. Yeah. And, and I've, I wish the agendas weren't there. The agenda should be for the truth. The agenda should be to do as much of a balanced, true uh, documentary as possible. Because once upon a time, the history channel, science channels, and even crime channels aimed for that. And I've seen so many of our channels go over to just ridiculous, ridiculous theory. Let's just go with this. Let's just say this didn't happen. Like, just crazy theory stuff going on because it makes money. And they'll throw those things out. And then the team gets together and say, yeah, let's do that. And then when the team gets together and somebody says, wait a minute, have you read so-and-so's book? And you actually interview her and you find out that she's not saying that? Oh, well, let's just dump her and pretend she never existed. And that's what they did to this woman who wrote the, the good book. <laughs> they decided she didn't exist. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Um, um, uh, yes, he did supposedly run out of the house after the phone call, but there, there, there really isn't a lot of, there's this, there's this whole theory that he somehow was involved in some really sketchy thing with the company. And I, I don't see that. I mean, he was a writer. He wasn't really one who was pr pr doing anything more than writing um, and doing, you know, independent writing stuff. Who knows? Whatever. Somebody could have, he could have gone to talk to somebody and he just, he, he was already psychotic at that point. And, he, you know, maybe it was a, what, maybe it wasn't even a big deal. You know, maybe somebody said something very minor and he, 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 he took it wrong and then ran out because he, or maybe he never even heard what the person said, you know, and they, he, he imagined something different was being said because I've worked with people who have schizophrenia and um, I've, I've had to be very careful. Sometimes I've, you know, had them get very angry with me uh, because they think I'm in cahoots with the person standing next to me who didn't, act, there was actually nobody standing next to me, but they, when they were signing, they were actually looking at this person. Let's see if I can do this. This, this person, they're looking over there and they're talking to this person, sign language, but you know, they're talking to them and getting very angry. And then they look at me and say, why, why are the two of you together? Why are you doing this? You know? And I'm like, I'm not, I'm, I'm your interpreter. I'm not with that person. <laughs> That's not really there, you know, um, but see, that's so it's very hard when you get into the mind of somebody like that. When they get a phone call, do we know that the phone call was truly a, a catalyst for what happened or, or not? You know, so it's very hard to say. Um, uh, well, that's interesting. Aunt Dini said, I had a friend who lost a buddy in a parachuting accident. They said there was no blood, but he was in a six foot hole. Interesting. Wow. Um, oh, well, the reason there was a reason, Alexandra, seven or eight days uh, dead in the heat. Amazing. No one in the hotel would smell every, anything. This was in an, un, an area that wasn't being used. That's why when they finally opened the door, that, that wasn't pleasant. Let's put it that way. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Um, The, that's, this is very good. The location from where he allegedly ran and left is an issue. Mur murderers are not going to take someone to a location where there are so many variables involved that could go wrong. It's not Hollywood. Exactly. I mean, simplicity is what you do when you want to off somebody. And, and, and generally speaking, something like that. I uh, say you're in Baltimore, you just shoot somebody. Shoot them or stab them in the, in the street. 
I mean, if he's running around there, at, 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 you know, getting out of his car and walking down the street, doesn't take much to shoot or stab somebody and just run off. I mean, there's a lot of unsolved homicides in, in Baltimore, which are based on those kind of weapons and those kind of murders. I mean, last thing you need to do is try to lure him to the top of a, a building and figure out how to chuck him off the roof. You know, I mean, and not be seen. You know, now they say nobody saw him. And it's one of these situations where this is where people start saying, well, he dropped from a helicopter because nobody saw him. Somehow nobody remembers seeing him. He either wasn't seen or nobody remembers seeing him. And, and it's always this concept that he's, you know, if somebody goes through a crowd of people, they're always going to be seen or remembered. And oftentimes it's simply not true. The person's looking this way and the other person's, or there's a bunch of people and they just never notice. Um, I don't know how he got up there. I don't. That's a, that is a mystery. Um, but I don't believe he was dropped from a helicopter. So if he wasn't dropped from a helicopter, the simple fact is he got up there. It's that simple. And if he didn't, he, if he himself, if somebody went with him, then there were two people who got up there. So now you're in the same situation. Uh, you could say somebody drove him up to the top of the uh, parking garage in the car, in their car, and they got out and he then ran and jumped off that. But see, again, around the parking garage, the parking garage, he couldn't have that, that the, he couldn't have accomplished leaping off the parking garage and making that hole because of the, the wall there and everything. It, it, it couldn't be done and he couldn't got, couldn't have gotten hit by a car. It couldn't have happened. So nothing happened in the parking garage except for the, the friends when they were searching, they were able to look over the edge of the wall at the part of the parking garage and see the hole down below at a distance. Um, but he did not go off the parking garage. So therefore he had to get up to the roof. So either he or, or he and a buddy or he and a whole group of people <laughs> had to get up to the roof and none of them are seen. So I would say it's easier for one guy to slip by than more than one guy to slip by. Um, uh, you can't go to parents of murder children any longer. The conventions are done. You were wrong. You would feel as though you're portrayed as a fraud. I've watched family members argue with profilers. Um, that is one reason I do not participate in certain things because there are certain people in the industry that do a lot of um, very strong uh, victim support. And I, I approve of that entirely when it comes down to just people who are supporting victims. But sometimes people who are in criminology or in profiling or whatever also do this massive victim support and what they do is try to keep on their good side by not speaking out and not saying what the truth is or what the facts are. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm liked by some, but not by everybody in that whole industry, shall we say. And consequently, I don't show up at those conferences. I, I did way, 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 way long ago. I think I was invited once. <laughs> I might've done it. Um, some people, again, some people really liked me, but because I'm very bl blunt and honest, um, it doesn't always go well because I... I can't, I can't pretend whether I can't pretend I can be sympathetic, but I can't pretend. So, yeah. Um, let's see. I'm getting to the end of the comments here. Um, he is a big, handsome guy and should be very memorable, but you know, it's hard to say people are, I don't know if they're drinking, people just weren't there. And this happens. This is not the first time this has happened where people say, there's no way he could have gotten there. But then you say, but he was there. <laughs> that's the answer. He was there. He had to get there somehow. So one can say it's impossible, but it's obviously possible. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I trust blunt and honest. Oh, thank you, Shirley. I, I, I try to, I prefer to go that way. I mean, um, I, it's, I think it's, you know, I've always believed that I prefer to hear the truth from people. I may not like it, I may not even agree with it, but at least I know where I stand. I, I, you know, I, when people aren't telling me the truth, I, you know, I feel like I'm being manipulated, which is, is which is true. Um, so I do. I, I feel the same for other people. They ought to hear my my honest opinion, and they can always disagree and they and they and whatever. But at least I'm not lying to them. You know, I'm not sitting there going, oh, well, I know I perfectly well agree with you, and I don't. Um, you know, that'll be a phony, and so. 
Um, no, I think people deserve, they have the right to know what you think, truthfully. I mean, I'm not talking about where you come up and say, my God, that's the ugliest damn dress I've ever seen on a human being. <laughs> I'm not talking about that kind of truth. <laughs> but just that, you know, when we when we uh, pretend um, or it's like we were, if we're manipulating people purely for the reason that we want to get something out of it, uh, we want to be popular, we want to be liked, we want to get a, you know, get a TV appearance. Um, uh, and we'll say whatever they want me to say or you to say that that bothers me because I just think it's it's wrong. So I don't I don't I don't like that, that kind of stuff. It doesn't just. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Most of us don't want anyone to lie to us. This is exactly correct. I mean, it's like, let's say, for example, uh, you know, just simple, take a simple example of people are cheating on their spouses, right? And they're like, well, you know, let's say they didn't want to tell their spouse for five years. Well, that's not right. The spouse had a right to know that the guy was, or the woman was not invested in the marriage. And sh that person, she or he, would have then the choice to decide what to do, like to confront and say, okay, we need to go to marriage counseling or, or I'm done whatever. But when you don't tell the truth, you take away the other person's ability to make the choices they should have the right to make for themselves. So, yeah. So I think that is a very good point. No one likes anybody to lie to us. But some people don't mind lying to everybody else because they don't care that those people don't know that they're being lied to. And they don't, you know, they're getting something out of it. So that's why they do it. But anyway, okay, that's it for Ray Rivera. I thought it was was not a mystery to me. Um, I mean, it's not a mystery to, as far as it, I, I, I believe it's an accidental death by psychosis, or you could you could say suicide, but I just don't know that that's proven. Um, but I certainly didn't see a homicide any place here. No evidence of that. And the, the Baltimore police were correct right up front. Uh, and there are people out there who just wanted to make it, you know, something else because it benefited them, not so much the truth. Um, so, but uh, oh, that's oh, that's a very good point. I got to say this before I go. Shirley says there's an idea that when someone lies, they're showing contempt for the person they're lying to. Oh yeah, they have. You know, when somebody does that, you they're not respecting you. Uh, so yeah, they're they are showing contempt. Absolutely, it's like, and I can get over on you too. You know, so it's like I don't really care about you. Yeah, absolutely, that is true. Uh, oh. Thank you very much, Aunt Dini. Um, okay, so that's that's that. Um, yeah, I thought it was fascinating. It was fascinating to learn about. And again, I'm going to put all the links to look below the pod, uh, the the uh, prosecutor's podcast. Uh, I don't know. I only have this uh, bit of their. They have this little thing on WordPress. I don't know how much more they have on their podcast, but I was impressed by what they had to say here. Um, and the uh, and and the woman who wrote the book for 99 cents. Check it out. I mean, uh, it's it's. Um, I'll, 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 in the link, I'll make sure to point out it's the, it's the 99 cent. I'm, I'm not actually. I'm not going to link the other book because if you want to find it, you it's it's already. Uh, I put the picture up. You can go and look at it. Stop the stop the video. Look at the picture and go spend ten dollars. <clears throat> but <laughs> don't. I personally think it's not worth it, and I don't want to recommend it. But I'm going to recommend the 99 cent book. I think she did a fabulous job, and I, I find it very annoying that they that kicked her out of unsolved mysteries. Um, and um, yeah, and I think that the the prosecutor's podcast is yeah was was quite was quite good. So uh, I'll put the link there so you can go find out more from them if you want to learn more about this particular case, more than I might have uh, put here in this video. So anyway, um, so anyway, thank you for being here. I'll be back uh, sometime this week uh, for the um, hangout, um, and please do. Uh, if you're watching this video, if you're watching a video live, uh, you have a couple, few more days to get the, the, the free books. And if you're watching this later on, uh, hopefully within 48 hours of me going public with it, I will do that as soon as possible. You can grab the books. But if you wait too long, yeah, the, the, uh, Kindle allows me five days to do a free promotion. And I haven't done this in years, but I just want to do it now because it's my second anniversary for the show. I finally hit two years. So it lasts five days and then, you know, that's it. And I can't, I can't take it. I can't keep it longer. So um, then you get to pay. <laughs> not that my book, not that my self-pub books are expensive. They're cheap, really cheap anyway. But um, anyway, thank you for being here. Um, it's been great as usual. I have my wonderful 
group of folks in here. Always makes me happy. And uh, yeah, no, uh, as far as I know, don't jump off any buildings. It doesn't end well. <laughs> you know, it doesn't end well. Yeah, there's not too many people who actually can fly. But, you know, you might make the, the, the new dimension and who knows, maybe I'll meet you there and I'll say, well, you know, you know, I was 89 when I left the face of the earth. How'd you get here? And you tell me you jumped off a building and there you are. So, all right. <laughs> what do I know? See, it all worked out for all of us. And maybe Ray someplace, you know, maybe that he is a, you know, in another, you know, in a spiritual world. No, I'm not going to say he isn't just because he jumped off a building, but I'm not sure what he thought he was doing when he did it. But I'm going to say it wasn't a homicide. So anyway, thank you for all for being here and I'll see you next time.